Okay, the next item of business is a debate on motion 9126 in the name of Stephen Kerr on ending violence in Scottish schools. I'd invite members wishing to participate in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I call on Stephen Kerr to speak to and move the motion. Uh, Mr Kerr, around 12 minutes, please. Presiding officer, this debate is happening today because we need to address the unacceptable level of violence. Excuse and me, Mr Kerr, can we have Mr Kerr's microphone, please? I'll start. Start again. Mr. Officer, so this debate is happening today because we need to address the unacceptable level of violence and disruption in our schools. My colleagues can attest that I am actually a very generous soul, and now my generosity of spirit extends to the Scottish Minister sitting opposite me. Because today I think we've helped them. Because I am pleased that they have accepted the motion in my name. So I accept their amendment in the same spirit. There, there, it can be done. Working across the chamber. The Cabinet Secretary has changed one or two things in her amendment from my motion, added in a bit about what they're actually doing to collect and collate missing data, uh, things that I'm calling for. And they will hold a summit, which I believe will inevitably lead to the setting up of a working group, as called for in my motion. This government amendment is a testament to the work of my colleagues over many months to highlight what is happening in our schools. The Cabinet Secretary could hardly do anything other than what she has done today in embracing the motion lodged by the Scottish Conservatives on Monday. Because I know, and Jenny Goldruth knows, this is what is now needed and will be supported by teachers, pupils and parents across Scotland, if and only if it leads to action. The summit should meet without delay. It should be inclusive. Yes. Martin Whitfield. I, I'm very grateful to Stephen Kerr giving way, and I would make mention of my declaration of interest as a former employee of East Lothian Council. Would the member agree with me that um, there is much, much to be grateful for in today by the Conservatives calling this debate and the agreement that seems to be extending across this chamber? But there is a matter of urgency in this case, and we cannot have delay being, being put in the way of actual solutions to this. Stephen Kerr, I give you the same back. It is absolutely urgent. I agree uh, with uh, my Labour colleague. It, and it should, this summit should be inclusive. Yes, it should include young people. But please, let's make sure, Cabinet Secretary, that there's representation beyond the usual bodies and voices. And there should be an action plan. Teachers and pupils should start the new term, which is less than 100 days away, with the clarity of guidance they need. Head teachers should feel confident that they and their staff have been heard and that political leaders have responded. The Cabinet Secretary should return to Parliament immediately following the summit and report the urgent actions that have been agreed. Members must be kept abreast of the outcomes of the summit. Hearing from our teachers will be key. And I want to quote Catherine Nicholl, the Scottish Secondary Teachers Association Union president, who said that many teachers feel that providing education in our schools is now subordinate to managing disruption. And she went on to say that at worst mob rule prevails in classrooms and corridors. The number of violent incidents reported is increasing. A culture of accommodating the needs of the transgressor has become the default position in some places. Learners who do come to school to learn do not feel secure. So I cautiously celebrate the, the Minister's announcement this week of a summit. But we have demands to make of the Cabinet Secretary in regards to the summit on school violence and disruption. One, the summit on school violence and disruption must meet within days. Two, there must be a statement in Parliament on the outcomes of the summit before the beginning of the summer recess. Three, there must be an action plan to tackle violence and disruption in schools ready before the start of the new school year. And four, this action plan must include A, a new standard reporting system for cases of violence and disruption in all 32 local authorities. B, a plan to address the increasing issues with attendance. C, new guidance for teachers, staff and school leaders. D, reform of the exclusions procedure 
to ensure that pupils who are excluded receive the support they need. And my fifth point, there must be a funding package for meaningful intervention to help every pupil who is a victim or a perpetrator of violence in school. And six, establish a national helpline to support teachers and staff who are afraid to report violence and disruption within their classroom or school. And the Cabinet Secretary knows that those teachers exist in large numbers. Liam Kerr. Yeah, I'm very grateful to remind the Chamber that my wife is an ASN teacher. The member will uh, have heard teachers in my constituency tell me of their frustration uh, at the failure of the Scottish Government to back its policies with funding and resource to make, uh, to make them real. But they tell me they're particularly frustrated with a government that blames the situation that you're describing, or the member's describing, on local authorities and teachers, and especially suggesting that teachers are insufficiently trained in de-escalation and making them do more CPD that they haven't got time for. So does the member share the desire of my constituents that the minister's response today takes ownership of these policy decisions and doesn't shift the blame and the responsibility for remedies onto teachers and local authorities. We have a little and time, we have a little and time in hand, Liam, but, but interventions are going to have to be a little bit briefer. I can give you some of that time back, Mr Kerr. Uh, and Liam Kerr makes a, a very good point. And the Jenny Ruth of last Tuesday, in answering a topical question from my friend Jamie Green, probably did convey that impression. But I think the Jenny Ruth that sits before us in this chamber today embracing our motion, putting forward a constructive amendment to it, is taking a different approach. And I hope that will be confirmed in her speech. Because the Scottish, very briefly. Brian Whittle. Does my colleague agree with me that the continued erosion of after-school clubs and youth clubs and extracurricular activities perpetuated by this government is a key driver of the escalation of school violence as well as poor mental health? And poor physical health in Stephen this country. We have, to make, we have to make the school experience, the holistic educational experience that many of us enjoyed when we were at school. That is the heritage, the birthright of all Scottish pupils, and that should be made a reality, and it isn't across Scotland. Scottish Conservative research has found that since 2017, there have been almost 75,000 verbal or physical attacks on staff. 20,000 of these happened in the 21-22 school year. This is a problem that appears to be getting worse. And one of the issues in gathering this information is the difference in recording standards between schools. That's why our demands call for a new national reporting framework. This is something that the unions have been asking for, something that we as political leaders should expect of government. Presiding officer, the government hasn't even collated, let alone published these statistics since 2016. And this omission must now be urgently addressed and the figures published. A pupil in a school in my area was violently attacked by some fellow pupils. Her attackers shared footage of the incident on social media. So the pu pu pupil wasn't only physically injured, but also suffered mentally, knowing that everyone at her school had potentially seen the video of her being beaten up. Those responsible are still at the same school. The head teacher felt they couldn't do anything about it, neither could the police. The victim attends school infrequently now and suffers from severe anxiety when she does. Teachers want a properly regulated classroom, but they feel they are unprotected and potentially open to legal consequences if they act against violent pupils. Our school leaders, as in this case, too often feel they have no sanctions. This is really a key issue for the summit. Pupils know it, teachers know it, parents know it. Removing perpetrators from classrooms is a vital first step but that can't be the end of the story, because exclusions must lead to something else. Because the offenders need help too, and returning them straight back into the classroom isn't a workable solution. There needs to be somewhere for these disruptive and damaged pupils to go. They need help, not isolation. And we also have a crisis in attendance. Alongside this, there is a growing challenge of internal truancy, where pupils go to school but refuse to go to class. The language of rights has taught some children to say that their teachers can't force them to go to class. There must be consequences to such disruptive and disrespectful behaviour. And we need parents to be involved in resolving these issues too. There should never be a culture 
that what happens at school stays in school. Parents must always be a part of the solution, but can add to the problems that teachers are dealing with when they fail to back the teachers. So giving teachers the tools and the guidance they need to deal with this will affect real change. Strengthening the authority of teachers will go a long way to helping resolve this important and difficult issue. Presiding officer, at decision time, we must, and I think we will, unite every member of this parliament of every party to support those entrusted with the teaching of our young people, to show them that we back them, that we appreciate them, but more importantly, in this debate on this subject, that we have heard them. They need to believe that at the summit on school violence, we will do something more than talk about getting them the help and support they need. The Cabinet Secretary told the teachers' conferences recently that she would work cross-party to bring about improvements in educational experience, outcomes and opportunities for our young people. Today, in supporting my motion, the government in which Jenny Gilruth serves can and is making a start on keeping that important promise to teachers and uniting this chamber in tackling violence in our schools. I move the motion in my name. Thank you very much, Mr Kerr. I now call on Jenny Gilruth to speak to and move amendment 9126.3, Cabinet Secretary, for around nine minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I move the amendment in my name. I thank the Conservatives for the opportunity to discuss an issue of vital importance to the education of our children and young people today. And as the motion, of course, notes, no pupil, teacher or member of school staff should suffer physical or verbal abuse and every child has a right to an uninterrupted school day. I wholeheartedly agree. And I give Stephen Kerr and this Parliament an undertaking that this afternoon I will work across parties on this issue because I know how important it is that we get this right for our children. Presiding officer, I want to give some context to the debate this afternoon because it was only in 1987 that the last area in Scotland banned the belt in school. And in fact, the relevant legislative loophole was only closed in the year 2000 with the Standards in Scotland uh, Schools Act. I remember being appalled as my principal teacher at the Royal High School in Edinburgh explained to me how, as a young teacher, she was taught how to belt a child. Lined up, the new teachers would practice by hitting a desk. The Scottish Office approved a two or three uh, leather Loch Gelly taws in different weights. Guidelines applied to its application. One such taws hung in the staff room of the last school I taught in. Framed, the sign below it read, in case of emergency, break glass. I was reflecting on that memory on Sunday morning when I read the headline in the Scotland on Sunday, Gilruth told to get tough on classroom violence. Now, earlier in the week, a former head teacher in the same newspaper wrote that some, about some wee thug who terrorises kids at break. Presiding officer, I want to start my contribution today by urging members to be careful in their application of language this afternoon. And maybe the Scotland on Sunday didn't mean the toss when they wrote uh, uh, Sunday's headline, but that is where my mind went. And the people that we are discussing today are children, not thugs. So let's all remember that. Absolutely. Willie Rennie. I think I was probably one of the last in Scotland to get the belt. They abolished it just after I left school. I'm not sure if there was a connection. But I completely agree with her. We need to deal with the root problems that young people express through distressed behaviour, deal with the problems rather than punish the solution. So I absolutely agree with her. My concern is that sometimes teachers go on a never-ending loop of restorative discussions with some pupils because there doesn't seem to be any alternative available. Will she be able to address that issue in the summit? Cabinet Secretary, I can give the time back. I, I recognise Mr Rennie's comment. I won't comment on uh, his experience at school, but um, I think in terms of the issues that he's outlined, I would probably reflect some of that experience in my own experience in the classroom. And I recognise that schools do need to put in place um, a level of behaviour management policies that support their staff. But yes, it can be deeply frustrating as a classroom teacher. I think I heard that in uh, Mr Kerr's response around about my contribution to the Teaching Unions Conference on this very issue. Staff need to feel supported and so do our young people. So I just provide that as context to where we are now because I think it's worthwhile all of us reflecting how behaviour in Scotland schools and the response from the authorities has changed in the interim 40 years. Now, I've been in post now, um, presiding officer, for I think uh, nearly two months. And during that time, I've made it absolutely clear that behaviour 
and that's broader than school violence. Relationships and well-being in our schools are among my top priorities. That's why I've already engaged with the Association of Directors of Education, yes, with COSLA on this issue, with our teaching unions, and it's why I've been visiting a number of schools in the last seven weeks, asking the staff directly about their experiences of behaviour and about culture in their schools post-COVID. And I think Stephen Kerr hit on a number of really relevant points, the first being on attendance. Um, I receive uh, fortnightly updates in relation to national attendance. And it's interesting to look at some of the changes in relation to certain year groups, who of course would have been the year groups that experienced the start of the lockdown uh, measures when they were going through, for example, that transition from primary into secondary. We're now starting to see some of that uh, show up in relation to attendance evidence. We also know that kids from poorer backgrounds are much more likely to uh, not attend school and not engage with the system. So it's important that we reflect that in government. There are different challenges for different peoples in parts of the country. And Yes, happy to take an intervention. Martin Winfield. I'm very, very grateful to Jenny Goldworth Giveaway on that point. And is she confident that that data is identifying that small, but I would still say significant group of pupils that are struggling just to return to school at all? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, in, in all honesty, no, I am not. And I have asked officials for further advice on this. I received the national picture and it's broken down by local authority area. I've asked officials for further advice on how we can try to get a more granular understanding of what's happening in our schools, particularly in relation to the year groups and I think uh, to the point the member makes. But in general, presiding officer, our, our schools are places of learning. They are sanctuaries for many young people, providing stability in an often chaotic world. And I don't think any of us should underestimate the impact of the pandemic on learning. We know particularly that for older... Um, I'd like to make some progress. I'll take the intervention from my former teaching colleague, Liz Smith, but then I'd like to make some progress. Liz Smith. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh, for the Cabinet Secretary taking that uh, intervention. She's just replied to me in a parliamentary written uh, answer about PEF funding, giving me the update figures. And in that, she knows a very high percentage of that PEF funding is being spent on extracurricular and on outdoor education, which is a proven track record on improving behaviour. Does she agree that that's something that could be looked at in her group? Cabinet Secretary. I recognise that. I very much also recognise the member's interest in this. And uh, obviously, I think she's taking forward a, a member's uh, bill on this piece of legislation uh, specifically. Uh, but I very much recognise the sentiment um, behind Liz Smith's question and happy to ensure that the summit will consider that in more detail. To make some progress, presiding officer, um, the pandemic impacted on, on children's learning. We know it created anxiety and stress. We know that that's impacted on behaviour in our schools. We also know that mental well-being of young people um, improved when lockdown conditions ended. And, of course, that uh, parent and carer's well-being was also impacted. So lockdown was really tough for our young people, and I think we need to reflect that. I, I don't use COVID as an excuse in that respect, but I do think we need to be mindful that COVID has changed the type of behaviour and the type of relationships that happen in our schools. And I, I suppose I go to Stephen Kerr's point around what's happening in relation to attendance. What I, what I don't see as Cabinet Secretary, because I get the national uh, evidence base in relation to attendance, is internal attendance challenges. So, for example, when young people get up and decide to leave a classroom and walk around the school, that isn't captured at national level. These are the things that I'd like to pursue you with the summit more broadly because I think it's important that we talk about them at national level. Um, I think it is also the case, presiding officer, that the majority of children and young people in Scotland are well behaved in school. I don't want to paint a false narrative here today and that relationships between our pupils and teachers are good. They have to be, otherwise our schools couldn't operate. But I do recognise very much so that there are challenges post-COVID. Yes, I'm happy to do so. Very, Stephen very brief intervention to say that's exactly why we must deal with the issue of school violence, because the vast majority of our children are going to school to learn and they're having a disrupted learning day, which is going to ultimately result in a poor outcome for them if we don't act. Cabinet Secretary, I can give the time I, back I to the interventions. Now, to the Conservative motion today, which talks about a, a working group, um, I'm not against a working group per se, but I would just gently suggest that we already have a working group in Scottish Government on this issue. So we have the Scottish Advisory Group on Relationships and Behaviour in Schools, which I chaired two weeks ago. I'd really like to make some progress. I'm now seven minutes in and I've had a number of uh, other points I'd like to make. Apologies. Um, but that includes representatives from COSLA, from our teaching associations, parents and carers, and it's jointly uh, chaired, of course, by COSLA too. So I don't think at this point we need another working group. Um, what we need is a call to action. And indeed, of course, the chair of the National Parent Forum told Radio Scotland, I think only this morning, that we needed that wider community approach. We can't expect schools to solve all of these problems on their own. Now, the government motion therefore proposes to convene a summit on behaviour in our schools, bringing together parents and carers, local councils, our teacher professional associations, young people and wider partners. We do need to trust our teachers, though. But we also need to support them. I think we've heard some of that already today. 
that is why our councils, who do have a statutory responsibility in relation to the delivery of education, have a key role to play here. We should not tolerate a blame culture in our schools, as I discussed recently at the SSTA's annual conference. So if a member of staff is struggling with a challenging uh, class, as I think I heard Mr Kerr allude to, then that member of staff should not be made to feel that they are the problem. They should be supported. Now, last week I addressed the Parliament about our behaviour in Scottish schools research, which is currently underway. The BISSER research is critically important in building our understanding of exactly what is happening in our classrooms, including what underlying factors might be affecting behaviour. This, this is the fifth wave of behaviour in Scottish schools research uh, since 2006. Stephen Kerr is right, quite right to say the last one was in 2016. It should have been carried out, of course, in 2020, but it was not because of the pandemic. Since I've been in post, I've asked if it's possible to have this information earlier. It's not because of the way in which the data is gathered. But in the interim, I do accept the challenge to government that we need to act. Now, we're already providing, as a government, over £2 million to support the delivery of a wide range of violence prevention activities within schools and communities. And where incidents already do occur in school, we accept that there should be an appropriate and a consistent method of recording incidents. And if members haven't already appraised themselves of HMIE's inspection, which was carried out, I think, in 2019 in relation to bullying, then I would ask them to please do so, because HMIE's inspection in relation to bullying shows a mixed picture in relation to how these incidents are recorded in schools. And I suspect in relation to violent incidents in schools or more challenging behaviour uh, generally, we would see a similarly mixed picture. And I think we need to address that at the summit too. Now, except the opposition have gathered um, a range of FOI data from individual local councils, but there are some challenges with that data. So, for example, I know that not all councils contributed to that data request. I'm also aware that councils, I think, as I've alluded to, use a variety of different approaches to gathering data on violent incidents. So I think we need to be mindful that the robust data that we will gather from BISSER will give us a more accurate picture in relation to the national approach. Presiding officer, I'm conscious of time. I can give you, as I say, I can give you a bit of time back for the interventions, if you could maybe Thank take you. us up 11 minutes. Of course, excluding a child or young person from school, whatever the circumstances, is an extremely serious step. It's not one that any teacher would take lightly. We also know that school exclusions don't impact on all young people equally. So evidence shows that children from ethnic minority communities, those living in poverty, and those with additional support needs are far more likely to be excluded. And exclusion can also have a really harmful impact on a young person's learning and their future outcomes. Now, currently in Scotland, we have record low levels of exclusion. And perhaps the opposition might argue that's a problem. But the OECD review in 2015 actually identified that Scottish schools are highly inclusive compared to other countries around the world. I think that's something we should be proud of. I don't want us to see record numbers of young people being excluded. I, I don't accept that's the answer. And I don't want us to demonise a generation of young people we, ha we can't go backwards, but I do accept the need for government to act. And those at the chalk face are really key in that respect. We need to remember that our teachers are skilled professionals. They work to defuse contentious situations on a, a daily basis, much like the role of the presiding officer in Parliament. So therefore, I will also convene a head teacher task force from across the education sector to consider the issue of school exclusions in more detail and to provide me with advice on suggested action before the summer recess. Presiding officer, it's clear that responding to the issues presented by changes in behaviour and relationships in our schools will need a partnership approach. It's right that we work to get together to come to solutions, and I'll be listening today for contributions from members to that end. Our teachers need that practical support in their classrooms. They also need backup from their management teams in schools. And yes, if incidents become more serious, they will need to know they have a supportive local authority who will work to support their professionalism and the children we entrust in their care. Because at the heart of this debate today is a generation of young people who have grown up with two years of disruption to their formal education. Punitive responses to that trauma won't work. We need systems to pull together for the benefit of our children. That will be how we get it right for every child. And I'm committed to engaging with every party to that end. Presiding officer. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I wish those head teachers more success than sometimes the uh, presiding officers are able to achieve. Um, I now call on Pam Duncan Glancy to speak to move amendment 9126.2 uh, are in seven minutes. Ms Duncan Glancy. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I move the amendment in my name. The transformative power of a good world leading education system can never be understated. I know that firsthand. My experience is not unique and was not without its significant challenges. But what it does show is that when challenges in education are overcome, when our education system works, it really can give young people a fighting chance at a future. But when it doesn't, that potential is wasted. 
That's why in the short time that I've had to witness it up close recently, I find it deeply sad that a once world-leading education system in Scotland is facing the challenges we see and discuss today. Regular challenges to authority, persistent refusals to adhere to school rules, online bullying of teachers and pupils, increasing bullying and harassment in schools, misogyny, pupils wandering around corridors rather than learning in classes, and physical and verbal abuse. This deepening, worrying culture in our schools is a sorry symptom, I'm afraid, of failure at the hands of a government that hasn't delivered on some of its promises, promises that it could have helped avoid the situation we're in. In failing, it has not only let down staff and pupils, but it has put the future and the next generation of our country in jeopardy too. The Cabinet Secretary was correct in her publicised remarks this week in noting that schools are facing challenges in the midst of a cost of living crisis that followed three very tough years of a pandemic. But she must also recognise that the impact of those challenges was deepened by the Government's inaction on recovery and its lack of proper analysis or plan to rebuild from the trauma of the pandemic in schools. The pandemic and the cost of living crisis of course impacted, but this problem was growing long before the pandemic. In 2018, there were 17,602 recent recorded incidents of abuse towards teachers in, so in Scotland. No one should ever be made to feel unsafe in their workplace. Alarm bells should have been ringing for the SNP long before it's reached this point. But instead, five years later, I'm afraid, it is only just admitting there's a problem. And we do, of course, welcome that they have. But in the meantime, the situation has escalated. NAS UWT estimate that the number of their members experiencing verbal abuse by a pupil has increased by well over a third since 2019. 16% have, have reported experience of physical assault this year. Rather than working to solve the problems, my fear is the SNP have exacerbated it by failing to meet promise after promise. One of the earliest promises made, way back in 2007, was to reduce class sizes. Sixteen years later, the proportion of classes with more than 18 pupils in them is higher than it was back then. Not helped by a drastic fall in the number of teachers, of course, which is reduced by over 900 in that time. Identifying challenges and needs of their pupils is something teachers are well-skilled and well-placed to do. But the strain on their resources and their time has left them overstretched and hindered in their ability to do that. A decline in the number of ASN teachers available to support pupils who need it, and against a cluttered backdrop of confusing and overlapping legislation surrounding transitions and access to additional support has made it worse. Teachers are left to pick up the slack, and the same is true too often of their pastoral duties. So that is why I welcome the SNP's commitment to increasing mental health support in counselling and schools that would have not only enlightened the re responsibility on teachers, but would have meant better support for young people too. But the truth is, the picture I, I will take an intervention. Stephen Kerr. I am grateful uh, for, you taking the uh, for the member taking the intervention. Mentioning mental health and support, would the, the member support our, uh, our suggestion, our demand? that there be a national helpline just for teachers who are facing particular stress, often feel they can't open up about it, often feel that they aren't maybe getting the support they would like from the school management. Would she agree that that form of helpline would be invaluable to some teachers who are currently suffering uh, as a consequence of what they're enduring in classrooms? Pam Duncan Glancy, I, I, I can give I, you the time back. Thank, thank you, Deputy President Officer, and I thank the member for that, that contribution. And I think that is a suggestion that I think could be very helpful, and it would be crucial to do that with the trade unions so that we understand fully what it is that teachers require. Um, but we definitely do need to address the fact that some teachers and, and um, people working in schools are worried about reporting by, um, incidents, and that could be a solution to part of this problem. So better support for our young people, but of course the truth, um, the truth is the picture across Scotland is too varied in terms of mental health support and a lack of consistency resulting from a lack of leadership, I think. Teachers are, in, uh, by the Scottish Government I should say, teachers are resilient and we saw that clearly in the way they stepped up and got on with it during the pandemic. But when their resources are stretched and support is lacking, it really does hinder their ability to make preventative measures. Where they are able to do so, they strive to implement restorative practices. As we have heard today, managing student behaviour has become increasingly difficult, not least as they are still struggling to navigate in the aftermath of the pandemic. That means many pupils lack routine and social contact. But the government have let them down, I think, by not evaluating fully the impact that this has had on them and putting in place a strategy to address it. 
Presiding officer, the digital devices, of course, promised could have bridged the access gap and the provision of bikes could have encouraged physical activity and improved mood, which would, of course, have helped too. But once again, these ideas have made aspirations overpromised and underdelivered. And so I'm afraid to say it's a very disappointing circumstance that has led us to this point, and a failure so systemic that it can't be ignored, and has led us to the dire situation that we're in and discussing today. It, I can take an intervention on that point if I can get some time back. Brief. Briefly, Mr Whittle. Very, very grateful to the member. Would you agree with me that the strategy going forward must look at long term, not just the current crisis, and, and the lo a long term strategy that tackles the, 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 the problem of not just the problem of violence, but the, the, the reasons for that violence in a sort of wider education uh, establishment? Pam Duncan Glancy. I thank the member for that intervention. I um, absolutely completely agree with that. And we, we need to look at the big picture in all of this and consider into the future too. We need to do all we can to ensure that our schools are safe and secure learning environments and workplaces. And it is high time, I think, this government took responsibility for fixing it. And so, whilst I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's announcement that there will be a summit, I'd appreciate recognition in closing that that alone will not be enough. And I've heard some um, commitments today that I'm really heartened to hear in that regard. But it has come quite late, and so actions must follow swiftly. Trade unions, teachers, parents, pupils themselves have been pleading for action for years, and they really are desperate. So they need more than just a talking shop or a photo op. And I am quietly confident um, that, that we can push in, in that direction. But it must be a space for teachers, parents and pupils to participate meaningfully, lead to a real plan to keep classrooms safe and require a comprehensive national strategy to combat violence in schools, dealing with the longer term approach that we've just heard about. The strategy must take account of the wider circumstances, of course, like the pandemic and the cost of living crisis, but also evaluate the impact of that and of continued cuts to local authority budgets on this circumstance. It will have to address concerns around hesitancy, of course, in reporting incidents, as we've heard, for fear of damaging school reputation by establishing a national framework for reporting that. And to do it, we must also be able to understand the, schools, the, the true scale of the problem. So I urge the government to do everything that it can. And I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's request to bring forward the research from the end of the year. But we can and, and should do something with the data that we have now. And trade unions have made that quite clear. The battle against this problem needs leadership from the government. And it must come alongside transparent and open communication that will allow the widest possible engagement but it's also to ensure that any outcomes are effectively implemented with the support of schools, pupils and parents. I and Scottish Labour will always have high aspirations for our education system in Scotland, as we do for all of the people of Scotland. And that's why we must all unite today in our determination to make sure our schools are safe, pupils are thriving and teachers have the resources to ensure both. Together, we can create an education system that uplifts and empowers every child to have a better future. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Willie Rennie at around six minutes. Mr Rennie. Yeah, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Uh, I'm a Liberal. I believe in tackling the root causes of behaviour rather than simply punishing the symptoms. I support an approach that hunts for the best in our young people, but I refuse to ignore the unacceptable behaviour that traumatises young people and staff. Now, we've heard about some of the figures and we need to have health warning on some of the collection uh, details on it. But it's quite clear that the numbers recently are at a five-year high, that the majority of incidents are in primary school, which is something that surprised me, but also that there is under-reporting that the unions are concerned that staff just don't think it's worth it in some occasions, so just don't report. So the numbers could be even higher, yes. Cabinet Secretary. In relation to the, the data that has been gathered by the, the Liberal Democrats that show, of course, an increase in incidents in primary schools between 2018-19 and 21-22 of less than 1%. Now, I hope the member recognises that. I am acknowledging there is a challenge here today, but I think we need to be pragmatic and realistic about the national picture when, in some instances in primary schools, that increase has been less than 1%. It's not substantive to that end. Willie Rennie. I actually think it reinforces our point that this is not a new problem. The pandemic has exacerbated the issue, but it's been there eh, for some time. So the Minister, I think, helpfully makes eh, that point for me. But I'm afraid up until recent months, the political and educational establishment have found this an inconvenient truth. Official figures haven't been collected for years, and we won't get the new figures for months yet. The last Education Secretary 
didn't even turn up to our own specialist working group in December. Education authorities often play it down because of a misunderstanding about the rights of children. I believe in getting it right for every child, but too often it can mean getting it right for the violent child, but not for every other child in the class. All children, I believe, have rights. The NASUWT say nurture principles must not be used as a methodology to cover up abusive behaviour or indiscipline or to reduce public exclusion figures. Some school leaders are concerned about the reputation of the school. I have had that myself. But I have to say I care more about the education and well-being of our young people and staff than the reputation of a school. Social media is sometimes blamed for inspiring attacks, but that often ignores the fact that the majority of the attacks are never filmed and never shared, so I don't think we should shoot the messenger. The time for excuses, I believe, is over. We do need to accept that there is a problem, and it has been a problem for some time. It is true that staff have reported an increase in distressed behaviour since children have returned from months of lockdown. But the violence existed long before that, and I think it's about time that we started uh, listening to that. Teachers should not have to return home at night battered and bruised, and parents deserve to know that their children will be safe at school. Now, the SNP uh, love a good summit, a working group, all sorts of consultations and various things, often to hide the absence of action. But at least this new summit, I suppose, allows us to make the case for change. And I do welcome the change of approach uh, from the Cabinet Secretary. And I have to say, it was a good speech that she made this afternoon, highlighting an understanding uh, of the issues that she has. But we do need solutions. For me, it's about confidence, tools and resources. Teachers need to have the confidence that the school leadership and the council have their back, that when they ask for help, they will get it. Outside the school, mental health and autism waits are far too long. In school, we need more staffing and classroom assistance. We need proper resourcing of additional support needs, which now covers one in every three pupils. It's an astonishing number. But there must also be a proper debate about how we apply, no, sorry, about how we apply the restorative approach. For the avoidance of doubt, and I've made this clear, I'm not for punishment, I'm for restoration. Some say schools don't exclude enough, that they are a soft touch, that the offenders must be punished and the police should be called. It would be a sign, I think, of a failed system if the only answer was increasing the number of young people branded as criminals, probably for life. But I hear reports that too often restorative conversations are seen as the only tool in the box. Teachers reporting persistent or more serious behaviour problems are trapped into a never-ending loop of restorative conversations with the same pupil and given no support for more serious consequences for regular or serious behaviour. A personalised solution, sometimes with individualised risk assessments, is required because every single young person is different. In some cases, what the deployment of consequences, even micro-consequences, is required to enforce boundaries of unacceptable behaviour. Others don't understand consequences, so in those cases, there is little point of the consequences. I have seen what works. In one struggling primary school, Aberlauer gave the young people the tools to cope with the pressures of school and family life. But Bannerman High School staff went on strike, and EIS members in Northfield Academy in Aberdeen balloted for strike because they just had enough of the violence and the behaviour issues without adequate support. Quick as a flash, the resources were found. It shouldn't take a crisis for the resource to be brought in. For many staff, teachers and pupils, violence is a daily occurrence. Too often they feel utterly helpless and ignored. We've got to start listening and, more importantly, acting. Thank you, Mr Rennie. We now move to the uh, open debate. Uh, I call first Murdo Fraser to be followed by Ruth Maguire. Uh, around five minutes, uh, Mr Fraser. Uh, thank you, Deputy uh, Presiding Officer. We've already uh, heard in this debate 
about the horrific statistics for the rise in incidents of violence in schools. However, what teachers tell me is that these statistics understate the problem, because Willie Rennie is quite right. In many cases, teachers have simply given up reporting incidents because they feel that the effort of filling in forms is no longer worthwhile, they feel it is a pointless exercise, and they believe that nothing will change. I wonder if I can just read a message I received from a primary school teacher in a school in my region. I won't name the school, it wouldn't be fair to do so, but it gives a flavour of what is happening in a primary school classroom today. And she writes this. I was pleased to see that you're raising the issue of school violence at Holyrood. My school is simply no longer a safe place to work, and I do not believe that those in authority understand the scale of the issue. We are, on a daily basis, sworn at, spat at, punched, scratched and bitten by children as young as five. We have books, chairs and tables thrown at us. Very young children trash classrooms and rip up other people's work, causing them great distress. I have colleagues who have had multiple trips to hospital as a result of attacks from a pupil. There are teachers in the school who have been off sick for weeks with physical injuries or with stress and anxiety. Some are literally too scared to come back to work. This isn't just an awful situation for the teachers. It is terrible for the majority of children who just want to get on and learn. Their life opportunities are being ruined by a small minority of disruptive children. The parents of these kids offer us no support and in many cases simply don't have the skills themselves to deal with their own children. The parents of the other children in the school are up in arms about the situation. What is so frustrating is that we lack the tools to deal with the problem. We are not permitted to exclude children, and there is literally nowhere else for these kids to go, so they have to remain in school no matter how bad their behaviour. Getting it right for every child is an absolute joke. We are letting down the children who can't behave by not tackling the problem at root, and we are letting down every other child in the class who themselves are in fear of being attacked and cannot concentrate on learning. I would encourage the Education Secretary to come and spend a day in a school like mine and see for herself what we have to put up with. It can't go on like this. Presiding officer, those are not my words, but of a teacher, a primary school teacher in a Scottish school today. And I know from conversations I've had and many others will have had with teaching union representatives that her experience is by no means exceptional. It does seem to be the case, as we've already heard in this debate, that since COVID and the interruption of schooling or nursery for many younger children, the problem has got worse. But it is clear it cannot be allowed to persist. So what needs to be done, presiding officer? Uh, I would suggest there are three things that need to be tackled. Firstly, we need to review the presumption against exclusion for those who have persistent behavioural problems. The Cabinet Secretary said in her remarks it was a positive that uh, exclusions were at such a historic low level. I'm not sure many teachers would agree with that uh, approach. Where you have children who are persistently disruptive or violent, it is simply unfair to the others in the class who just want to get on and learn in a safe environment that they continue to be there. Yes, I'll give way. Yes. Cabinet Secretary. I thank the member for, for giving way. I, I broadly recognise that the point the member is making in relation to exclusions, having taught disruptive classes in my previous life. And so I do recognise how that can impact on others' learning. But I suppose my question to the member is this. Is the answer that we have an increase in relation to the number of young people who are excluded? Is that actually an answer? Is that going to meet their educational needs? Or is there a better approach to how we can frame support for them going forward? Because I'm not necessarily sure that having a huge increase in the number of exclusions we currently have would be a signal of success. Murdo Fraser, I can give you the time back. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I kind of thank the, the, the Cabinet Secretary for that intervention. I think the answer, and I'm about to come to precisely this point, is what alternative provision is put in place for those children. But the second thing I was going to say, and, and it ties in with, with my first point, is the policy of mainstreaming those 
who have very serious behavioural issues needs to be reconsidered for the same reasons. But the third point, and this addresses what the Cabinet Secretary said in her intervention, we do need to make sure there is alternative uh, and appropriate provision for those who cannot, for whatever reason, be in mainstream education. And that might be dedicated units within schools, or it might be alternatively separate schools for those whose behaviour means that they are a risk to others. And very importantly, there needs to be a distinction between two, two different groups here. On, on one group, on one hand, you have children with uh, serious de developmental issues or uh, uh, learning difficulties. And they should not be lumped in, as too often happens in the case at the moment, lumped in with children with behavioural or discipline issues. These are two quite separate categories of pupils, and too often they're put in together, and that is not to the benefit of the children in the first category. So I hope, presiding officer, I hope, presiding officer, that these are all practical steps the Scottish Government will consider. I very much welcome, like Stephen Kerr did, the fact we're having a summit. A summit is good, but it cannot just be a talking shop. It actually has to come up with some concrete changes in policy that will then be implemented. Because there is an epidemic of violence in our schools, and it is getting worse. We are letting down a generation of children, and we are at risk of losing good teachers from the profession if we refuse to deal with it. So we must see action. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peter. Uh, we still have a very little bit of time in hand, but I don't think um, I or subsequent presiding officers are going to be able to be quite so generous in giving back the time for those interventions. Uh, with that, I uh, invite Ruth Maguire. It uh, will be followed by Rachel Hamilton around six minutes. Ms. Maguire. Thank you, presiding officer. Our schools as workplaces and learning environments must be safe. Physical force, verbal abuse or threats, including prejudice-related incidents and damage to property, are all forms of violence that are completely unacceptable. No one in our schools, no pupil, teacher or member of school staff should be abused, threatened or assaulted. The violence reported in the media which has prompted our recent debates is shocking and I am of course particularly concerned for any individuals harmed. No one should feel frightened or unsafe in their place of work or learning. I note and accept the Cabinet Secretary's comments around data. This is a serious matter which needs to be dealt with seriously in a calm, considered way with a proper understanding of the scale of the issue. Inflaming things will only cause more stress and anxiety to teachers, pupils and parents. I won't be alone in having had feedback from teachers that the manner in which we discuss education and its subsequent reporting in the media can really impact on them. I know that we all understand the pressures faced by them and the vital work they do every day in our classrooms, and we'll be keeping that in mind today, and also acknowledge that this topic is not new to our skilled teaching workforce. Presiding officer, local authorities have a statutory responsibility for the provision of education in our schools, and all Scotland schools and colleges should have strategies to address, prevent and deal with work-related violence, including verbal and physical abuse of staff. I'm very grateful to my own local authority, North Ayrshire, for keeping me informed of the work that they're doing in this regard. In June 2023, they will introduce a new health and safety incident recording system, and it's anticipated that this will have an impact on the incident reporting process in terms of quality and quantity of data being collected. They've established a working group to address how health and safety incidents are reported and supported across educational establishments, particularly those relating to violence towards staff and pupils. The group, whose remit has been agreed with trade unions, will carry out detailed data audit and analysis to focus attention on those areas where improvements can be made in the processes and procedures for handling incidences of violence in North Ayrshire schools and supporting those affected by it including developing a consistent, a consistent process to record, respond and reflect on incidents with the intention of reducing the frequency of incidents and increasing support to those involved and, importantly, raising awareness of and improving access to advice, guidance and training for all staff. They have told me that the aim is that North Ayrshire Council's Education Service will have reviewed and designed processes which ensure staff are knowledgeable and confident in dealing with incidences of violence and in building positive relationships with young people, and that senior leaders will be confident in enabling staff to undertake professional learning in this area. And in the steps, I will take an intervention. Yeah. Rachel Hamilton. 
the intervention. Um, in my constituency, it's not about uh, the logging of the incidents, it's about empowering teachers and giving them the confidence and the, and the safe space to be able to do that. And I think that is something that the government can actually help um, to encourage. Ruth McGuire. I'm grateful to Rachel Hamilton for the intervention, and I think what she says is perfectly, perfectly reasonable. Um, I think the points the Cabinet Secretary made in her opening speech about culture are very important and illustrate why this is about so much more than what goes on in the school building. Covid lockdown and school closures were very hard on some pupils and indeed some parents. There was quite a complex mix of changes and disruptions for children and young people to deal with. And as is frequently the case, those with greatest existing challenges will have been impacted the most. In briefing me, my own local authority confirmed that the ASN sector accounts for around half of all incidents reported to them. And these incidents are due to distressed behaviours displayed by young people where there's no intent of harm on their part. As seems to be commonplace across the country, incident figures in North Ayrshire post-COVID have seen a rise from all sectors. In part, culture relates to behaviour and it's important to look at things that drive aggressive behaviour but we do also need to look more broadly at things like attendance. As was mentioned those who faced transition periods for example primary to secondary during lockdown or young people with caring responsibilities or those who were shielding will have found a return to in-person schooling a challenge. Teachers are very well trained professionals however I recognise their frustration at what sometimes feels like an endless list of social woes which we all have a responsibility to change being landed at their door. Responding to a need for culture change requires society as a whole. In that regard I welcome that the Scottish Government will continue to engage with trade unions and later publish updated material showing the national picture. Responding to the issues presented by changes in behaviour and relationships in our school requires that partnership approach. So it's good to hear the government will be working with COSLA, ADES, trade unions, parents and pupils. I think we all agree that any form of violence in schools is completely unacceptable. Today I think we can also agree that it's clear that working in partnership is the way to promote acceptable behaviour, prevent violence and disruption and ensure that our learning institutions are safe and productive places for pupils and staff. Presiding officer. Thank you, Ms. McGuire. Uh, I now call Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Alec Rowley at uh, up to five minutes. Please, Thank you, Presiding Officer. A lot has gone wrong in our Scot Scottish schools over the last 16 years. And whilst I welcome uh, the government's announcement on the emergency summit, which was forced, of course, by the Scottish Conservatives, standards have slipped, and we know that. Our education has plummeted down international league tables. There's declining performances in primary school for literacy, reading, writing listening, talking and numeracy. But none of that is the fault of the teachers. The quality of Scotland's teachers is one of the few remaining shining lights in our education system. And whilst the SNP have done huge amounts of damage to the reputation of our schools, they've not managed to prevent the thousands of brilliant Scottish teachers from continuing to do what they do best. I say yet, because the trend is concerning. Teachers are under more strain and pressure than ever before because of the system the SNP government have created. They're suffering from more abuse and violence than ever because of SNP government reforms. It turns out, despite the government acting for years as if it is not the case, that broken promises have consequences. The SNP promised to make education their number one priority. But this... Yes. Cabinet Secretary. I'm just keen to understand from the member which reforms brought forward by this government have increased violence in our schools. I'm at a loss to understand what that might be. Rachel Hamilton. Well, presiding officer, that will become apparent during the speech where I will give examples from um, whistleblowers in my constituency and the pressures and strains that they're under because of the curriculum and because of other issues surrounding government decisions made around schools. And if you can't see that, Cabinet Secretary, I mean, yeah. Well, uh, I, I, I would advise you to, because there are many teachers watching this today. Um, the, the former First Minister promised to close the attainment gap. There's an example between richer and poorer pupils, but it's as wide as ever. What more evidence do you want than that? The impact of those broken promises are clear in classrooms across the country. The SNP government failed to live up to the lofty expectations it set. It left teachers to pick up the pieces. They forced 
uh, to somehow manage to deal with mountains of extra bureaucracy put on them by a flawed curriculum, as I've just highlighted to the Cabinet Secretary, who seems to be blind to these issues, presiding officer. No, thank you. They have been made to somehow... No, thank you. They have been made to somehow keep standards high whilst the SNP uh, cut teacher numbers, centralised decision-making uh, with councils and, and towards crumbling national agencies long overdue a radical overhaul. They've been put in difficult, almost close to impossible positions by 16 years of confused reforms that have tried to turn teachers into social workers who must place a far higher emphasis on children's happiness than their learning and development. And this SNP government has forgotten that schools are places for disciplined buildings of knowledge, of skills, of building character. They've left teachers without enough support but expected them to somehow set things straight anyway. Our schools have wonderful teachers who can do all they can. They've struggled on, they've succeeded despite the government's reforms. They've helped tens of thousands of young people to get ahead and go on to fulfilling careers. But they've reached breaking point, presiding officer. They are saying resoundedly that this cannot continue. The consequence of SNP failure to manage our schools properly is a teaching workforce subjected to appalling levels of abuse and violence. As they try their hardest to somehow live up to the expectations placed on them by this Cabinet Secretary, by the SNP, they are met by a very small number of pupils who have been handed a free run to ruin the learning environment. I recently heard from a constituent who is a teacher about a steep rise in violence in her school, the horror story, as she put it. It is one of a small group of kids rampaging through the schools on a near daily basis, throwing chairs, pouring glue over carpets, wielding weapons like metal bars. She described children unsafe, adults in tears over violence and emotional stress, and some people sent to hospital. She said her school has done all it can, but it doesn't stop. That would be bad enough on its own if teachers had a way of speaking out about these issues, but they feel that they don't. Teachers say they have no real recourse when violence strikes. They fear repercussions of their career. They feel powerless to prevent abuse. And as it stands, only in teaching does it seem to be considered OK for staff to be battered and abused without repercussions. This culture of silence that is developed over violence in schools must end, presiding officer. It is failing everyone, not only the teachers, but the majority of well-behaved pupils and the concerned parents too. In conclusion, presiding officer, the government must answer for its reforms, the impact of its changes to the relationship between teachers and pupils and the promises it has broken. Thank you. I now call Alec Rowley to be followed by Fulton McGregor around six minutes, Mr Rowley. Thank you, presiding officer. In speaking in this debate today, I want to first acknowledge the hard work, the dedication and the commitment of the staff working on the front line of our schools. There is no doubt that the last few years have been challenging for staff and pupils, but be in no doubt, many of these challenges have been years in the making and have been a cause for concern raised with this government time and time again. As pointed out by the National Association of Schoolmasters and Union of Women's Teachers in a brief for this debate today, they say behaviour in schools is not simply a post-pandemic concern. NASUWT has been raising concerns relating to pupil behaviour for some time. Back in May 2019, the union requested violence at work be placed on the agenda for discussion at the Scottish Advisory Group on Relationships and Behaviour in Schools. They go on to say, while the Scottish Government committed to gather all existing resources into one place, the drafted documents fell short in terms of both its clarity and ability to support and effect real change for teachers on the ground. So given today that there now seems to be a further commitment from the Government to work towards recording violence and behavioural incidents in our schools, one can only hope that this time it actually happens. And that is that this Government needs to listen to stakeholders as they develop their approach. As Martin Whitfield said, in welcoming the fact that there is to be a summit, there is an urgency about this. It needs to happen, and it needs to happen as soon as is possible. More important, we need to know what actions 
and what funding will be brought forward to support the actions and support what needs to happen to support teachers and indeed pupils. The majority of pupils in our schools are well behaved, but the majority of pupils in our schools become the victims of those who do not behave and their education suffers as a result of that. I have lost count of the number of times that parents have approached me about behavioural problems in schools and told me that those who misbehave seem to be rewarded. So we really need to address this issue. It is not about calling for people to be expelled or suspended from school, but there has to be an alternative. We have to stand up for the majority who are behaving and want to learn and are going to school to learn. The failures of this government have been highlighted already, but these include the failures to deliver on class sizes, teacher non-contact time, support for pupils with additional support needs, mental health support for young people, failures to address harmful online content, continuing inequalities and cuts to our youth services. In our schools and across the entire education system, Scotland's children are being let down. I would point to the answer to my recent question asking the Scottish Government what the average real term spending based on current prices was for primary, secondary and additional support need pupils in each year since 2007. The response I got back from the Cabinet Secretary highlights quite starkly some of the problems facing school finances. The additional support for learning spending has fallen drastically over the past 10 years. A consistent drop in nine out of the past 10 years from 2012-13 through to 21-22. The real terms spend for additional support for learning per pupil has been cut by 35 per cent. There was also a sharp decline in primary spending from 2010 onwards, which is only recovered now to pre-2010 levels last year. On top of this, there was a steady decline and stagnation of spending on secondary education from 2008 onwards, only starting to increase again in 2018, but with the late, latest spending still not back to pre-2007 levels. So there has been a massive cut taking place in spending in education in schools up and down Scotland. So is it any wonder that against this financial background, teachers are feeling overwhelmed? And is it, any wonder, is, is it any wonder that Scottish Government has presided over a sharp drop in specialist teachers while the number of pupils with additional support needs has soared? The number of specialist teachers supporting children in primary school with additional support needs has fallen from 858 in 20, 2008 to 442 in 2022. Again, not acceptable. Put simply, presiding officer, it is not good enough. We need an education recovery plan that recognises the need for more additional support teachers, that recognises the need to address the teacher-pupil ratio, that will cut class sizes and recognises the major pressures on our schools. The fact that the number of teachers in Scotland has fallen, fallen by 907 since 2007, with a drop in 92 in the last year, should raise concern with all of us in this chamber today, at a time when many probationary teachers say they cannot get a job. In our amendment, we also highlight the cuts to youth services. Youth clubs, youth support, youth workers up and down Scotland have been cut and are now at the bone. There's hardly any youth services left. So it's not just about the school, it's about the support that is round about the school. We can do much better, so I hope this summit is the start. I hope the Cabinet Secretary is serious about this, and I hope that she will come back here and tell us what actions and how those actions are to be financed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Rowley. I now call uh, Fulton McGregor to be followed by Pam Gosell. Around six minutes, Mr McGregor. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. Um, no doubt that today's debate is an important one, and it's one where I believe we've already seen that there is, uh, across the chamber, people are actually in, in agreement, and I think we've heard some of that already. The topic of this debate it was no doubt triggered by the ugly events in Renfrewshire last week, but unfortunately, as we all know and we've heard already, this has not been an isolated incident. Schools are a place where both students and staff should feel safe, 
and not have to worry about acts of aggression, both physically and mentally. However, we are now regularly seeing reports of violence in primary and secondary schools, with reports suggesting a surge of violence compared to even pre-pandemic levels. I have no doubt that every member in this chamber, whether they are speaking or not, has engaged with casework where a student or indeed a staff member has had to contact their MSP over acts of violence and intimidation in their place of study or work, and particularly in schools. And this, of course, is not right. I have met with many students, parents and administrators whose lives have been appallingly affected by violent acts in schools, and we can all agree that violence is never acceptable and the safety of pupils and staff is absolutely paramount. And that includes all pupils, and I really welcome the Minister's, the Cabinet Secretary's open, opening remarks when um, cautioning against the, the use of language in, in how we approach this debate, because we are talking about children in the round. In looking at the reasons for the increased instances of these events, there are a number of things we must be uh, considered and mindful of. Although we are talking about behaviour in schools, this behaviour does not occur in a vacuum. Circumstances at home and other external factors, such as of course social media and the influence that has, are often leading causes for individuals to be violent in a school setting. This is something that schools can do very little to address, yet teachers are still expected to diffuse the challenging scenarios on a daily basis. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the schools in my constituency for their engagement with me on the issue when I have had to speak to them about it, and their desire and ability in a lot of occasions to respond quickly, quickly and innovatively to these situations. And there are some great examples happening across the country, but I feel particularly in Coatbridge and Chrysan, and I have seen some of it in action. The Scottish Government has prepared us to divide the national, devise the national approach to bullying in 2017 with the launch of Respect for All, which provides a holistic framework for adults working with children and young people to address all aspects of bullying. The Scottish Government still places emphasis on preventing bullying in the first place, and the Education Secretary recently stated uh, that the in a quote, preventative approach is critical. Children who grow up with less trauma, surrounded by love, are much more likely to fulfil their potential and enjoy wellbeing. And it's a, quote that I completely uh, agree with. It is good to see that the Scottish Government remain committed to working together with COSLA and the Scottish Advisory Group on Relationships and Behaviours in Schools. Engagement with local authorities must be a core part of Scotland's approach to resolving violence and bullying in schools. And as I said, there, is the, there must be great examples across the country. And I want to um, take the opportunity to highlight the example of Coatbridge High, uh, where there um, has the, done a lot of work to tackle bullying uh, uh, within the schools. And, uh, encourage the Cabinet Secretary, if she has got time, to, to pay a visit to that school or any other in my area. Our local authorities have a statutory responsibility for the provision of education in our schools, so they must remain a key partner in combating this issue. As well as COSLA, I welcome the Education Secretary's discussions with the Association of Directors of Education in Scotland and the teaching unions on this issue. Further government support can be seen with the investment of more than £2 million on violence prevention. Projects that this large investment supports include Mentors in Violence Prevention, which is delivered in schools and supported by Education Scotland. Medics Against Violence, who run several violence prevention programmes targeting the impacts and consequences of violence. And of course, the No, no Knives Better Lives Engagement programme through Youth Link Scotland, which is focused on preventing the incidence of violence and knife carrying amongst young people and provides resources and support to local partners. And in uh, my area of uh, Coatbridge uh, in Christ, and that's a particularly um, welcome uh, uh, initiative. Um, uh, and we know that there's been issues with knife carrying in the West and Central Belt of Scotland historically, so I completely welcome that initiative. However, while I can commend the Scottish Government on the work done so far, I also believe that it is those head teachers, teachers and other school staff and local authorities who are best placed to decide how to address bullying in their schools. Schools are expected to develop and implement an anti-bullying policy, which should be reviewed and updated regularly. For us to entrust schools with this responsibility, we must make sure that they are fully informed and have the latest information in hand. Yeah, that's fine. Stephen Kerr. Grateful to the member for giving way. He's mentioning a lot of initiatives, all of them very worthy. But does he also agree that there should be some additional support for teachers who sometimes feel cornered by what's happening in their experience in the classroom? Would he support the, the call that we have made today for a national help, a confidential national helpline that teachers can get the help that they need to be able to deal with the situations they are trying to cope with in our classrooms? Fulton McGregor. Yeah, I, I thank the uh, member for that intervention. I do not disagree with the premise of what he said there. I mean, who could? It's, it, it's, it, it, the premise is, is, is simple, but this is a, a very complex issue, which he knows he's, he's brought it to the chamber. He knows it's a complex issue, and the cabinet secretary has found a lot of agreement with you on this. 
the, these benches are finding agreement with you. I think we, we need to work together to find the best solutions. The point I was making there before the intervention was it is down to schools to, uh, although there will be a national framework, there is, it is down to schools to decide how to tackle these issues in their own communities, because all our communities are very different. The, the motion, I see I'm actually quite um, close to the end of my time, so but the motion today calls on the Scottish Government to increase data collection and publication. I agree with this sentiment, as recording and monitoring helps organisations identify recurring patterns, which enables early intervention and appropriate support at a local level. The Scottish Government has now stated that updated material showing the national picture in relation to this issue will be published later this year. President officer, I, I did uh, have other things to say, but and just to very briefly conclude then, as, as I'm over my time, uh, the issue of violence in schools is a grave one. I, I thank the Conservatives for bringing this to the Chamber today, and also the Government for their, for their um, amendment. The upcoming review must revisit the issues uh, quickly, the definition of bullying, the changing world of online bullying, and we must get to the bottom of this and continue, as this Parliament is doing today, work together to tackle this very, very serious issue that faces our young people. Thank you, Ms McGregor. And I now call Pam Gozo to be followed by Co-Cap Stewart. Ms Gozo. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am honoured to contribute to this important and much-needed debate on violence in schools on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives for our party business. I am not surprised this debate is coming from these benches, because more than a year ago, when I asked the former Cabinet Secretary what action the SNP would take on the abuse experienced by teachers, she abdicated responsibility and said she would step in if there was a requirement for further support. But in truth, we are long past that point. My colleague Stephen Kerr pointed out there have been almost 75,000 verbal or physical attacks on teachers and staff since 2017. And our schools have become not just a torturous place for pupils and staff, but dangerous too. On around 200 different occasions, dangerous weapons were seized from school pupils in the past year. This much is clear, clear presiding officer. We need to see action and we need to see it now. Earlier this year, I visited a construction at home. And I heard firsthand about the harrowing experience that a small girl went through. She reported an incident uh, involving a dangerous weapon, which went unnoticed in a supervised area. But after doing some digging, her father realised that none of these incidents were reported on CMS in line with government policy. Presiding officer, this isn't just one isolated incident. The report published by the CRER states that 61% schools have not used and reported on, CR, uh, sorry, on the CMS bullying and equalities on the recording system. Would I get the time back? Uh, well, there's still a, a very small bit of time in hand. Martin Whitfield? Happy to take the I'm very grateful, Pam Gosell, giving way. Does she not also agree with me there is a challenge between the reporting that's required under health and safety as an employment matter, where an injury or risk occurs, and the reporting for the dangerous behaviour or unusual behaviours within school that CMAS captures? Pam Gosell. I thank the member for that intervention. Absolutely. Both are very important to be reporting on both. Yes, and absolutely. Uh, so, <laughs> back to it. so I cautiously also welcome the Cabinet Secretary's supporting Scottish Conservatives' proposals to ensure that the right national framework for accurately reporting incidents of violence and disruption within schools is in place. Another parent in my region, whose child was bullied daily, asked the school to intervene, but the bullying only got worse. The pupil had to be given a hall pass to be excused from classes early to avoid a kicking. What message does that send to the bullies and those being bullied? To the former, it suggests they can bully without consequences. But to the latter, it suggests they should simply hide. Some educators are so scared to even take action or speak up about this because they might end up facing backlash from pupils and parents. 
They shouldn't be frightened to do the right thing, presiding officer. Therefore, I am pleased that the government has listened to our calls for ensuring the right guidance is out there on exclusion laws and policies, and I appreciate commitments to understand the root causes of distressed behaviour. We in this chamber all know that bullying causes untold damage on mental health and on a children's ability to learn. From those two stories I have shared with you, the young girl I referred grew anxious and was unable to attend a single class in 18 months. And the young boy became withdrawn and after moving school, his parents soon discovered he was around two years behind pupils his age. For too long under the SNP, education, despite being hailed a priority, was always on the back burner. But after hearing the contributions from today, I am confident that there is a cross-party commitment to introduce a violence reduction plan urgently. In conclusion, presiding officer, 16 years of neglect under this SNP government has left children to fend for themselves and has left teachers as punching bags. And, the, and this is why the Scottish Conservatives' debate on violence in schools is timely and necessary. I truly hope the SNP are listening today to all of the parents, children and teachers who will be watching this debate, who have suffered the consequence of violence in schools and will right this wrong by creating a national framework for reporting introducing an immediate violence reduction plan, reviewing the policy and guidance related to exclusions and assisting parents and schools to tackle violence and disruption in the classroom. Thank you, Ms Gozo. I now call Cocab Stewart to be followed by Ross Greer. Ms Stewart. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I refer to my register of interests. As a former primary school teacher myself, I retain my passion for education, and I visit schools across my constituency almost every week. I like to know what's going on in the system because it matters to young people, to all of us in this place and beyond. But I do want to continue by saying that this is a problem. I am uh, not, and I hope nobody is here going to deny that, and I welcome this debate. Yes, of course, there has been an uptick in poor behaviour in our schools since lockdown, and this has created serious challenges. But I would add that the reality is nothing like the lawless, out-of-control environment that has been portrayed by some opposition members. The vast majority of our classrooms are happy learning environments that are supported by a rights-respecting agenda. However, this isn't only... Um, I'll give way. Stephen Kerr. Uh, Co-Cab Stewart recognises that opposition members are not making up stories. We're not trying to paint a false picture. We're trying to convey something that is authentic and, and true. And to say otherwise, I think, is, is not right. So does she agree with the fact that there is a problem and it is growing and we should tackle it and take action this day? Cocab Stewart. I thank Mr Kerr for that. And I absolutely acknowledge that this was a problem. Um, uh, however, I am also... Uh, here to remind us that the vast majority of our classrooms are happy learning environments. We must remember that also. It's not only a Scotland-wide problem. Similar trends are being seen in England and Wales and actually across the world. A side effect of lockdown with measures that were necessary, but the additional challenges that have come down the line uh, that have come that we have to deal with. If we don't get this right, we're not just letting down our current dedicated teachers, but we do risk stifling uh, an entire generation of young people who need not only our love, care and support, but also clear boundaries, consistency and support. I hope, presiding officer, to offer some constructive suggestions based on my own experience and the experiences of those still working in the profession. The feedback that I'm getting is that some children who have returned to full-time physical attendance at school are seriously struggling to get back into school routines. For some, this has uh, resulted in 
poor behavioural issues and unfortunately on occasions has resulted in some horrendous incidents which colleagues have mentioned uh, where others have been made victims and faced terrible harms. Any parent of any child growing through that would be understandably furious, sickened even. In my view, when a bullying incident occurs, there are at least two victims, the bully and the bullied. I am yet to meet a happy child who misbehaves, who picks on others, who acts out, who disrupts class. But I welcome the Conservatives accepting that a summit would be a better place to bring everyone together to secure the support that is required. And that would be support for the pupils who are the victims, support for teachers who are also victims, support for children with the behavioural challenges, and importantly, we must support the parents of those children as well. I've yet to meet a parent, though, or a household which is falling short of a child's needs that isn't struggling severely in other areas of their lives, such as with finances, bereavements, and I'm talking about adverse childhood experiences here, which are inevitable impact. Mental health support is a key element to reaching a solution. Child psychologists, amongst other professionals, are well-placed to identify trauma and offer solutions perhaps even working with entire family units. I'd be grateful to know more about what plans the Scottish Government has to extend mental health support in our schools to children with behavioural issues, as well as those who have been victims of bullying or violence, and of course their families. Um, I need to press on. Um, I want to talk about incidents and the reporting and recording of these. I agree that there must be a national framework where we can better understand the data around this. However, I would stress that the current systems that are in place can be and are laborious, time-consuming and take teachers away from the jobs that they actually train to do. I would be grateful if the Minister, in summing up, could provide any assurances that this will be discussed with the teaching professions, workforce trade unions, to find solutions that give us an accurate picture of classroom and playground behaviour, but streamlines the reporting procedures, allowing teachers to do their jobs. We need to also talk about trigger thresholds. If a teacher is facing consistent issues within the classroom, a local authority can step in and offer targeted support. But in my view, this trigger must be much earlier. And as previous me uh, I mentioned, counselling and support should be consistently provided to the teacher and pupils involved, but also including their families where possible. All behaviours are forms of communication, presiding officer and teachers are well-trained professionals who know how to recognise when a child is in distress. What they are needing support with is around that wider conversation about how to uh, accommodate and deal with um, uh, the support that the children need, uh, working with school positives, uh, sorry, working with school policies around positive relationships based on mutual respect. Um, I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to skip to, I, if you just indulge me, there is a poem about, uh, from Dorothy Liu Nolt, um, and it's about how a child lives. And the bit that struck me was that if a child lives with criticism, he learns to condemn. And if a child lives with hostility, he learns to fight. And it is up to us to come up with the solutions to make sure that, as the poem goes on, it talks about if a child lives with fairness, he learns justice. And if a child lives with security, he learns to have faith. We need to have faith in a secure uh, education system where everyone is free to thrive. Thank you, President. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. I now call Ross Greer to be followed by Jack Hinton Bar. Mr. Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I was genuinely and pleasantly surprised to see the Conservatives break from tradition for opposition education debates and propose something today which is genuinely constructive and which gives Parliament an opportunity to discuss a really serious issue. See, they're, they're enjoying uh, that reflection. I welcome the fact that they've accepted the, the government's amendment. As the motion says, every young person, every member of school staff has the right to a school day uninterrupted by violence and disruption. But clearly that isn't the reality for everyone. Last year's report on life in Scotland for LGBT young people certainly confirmed that. Seven in ten gay and lesbian young people have been bullied at school. For bisexual and trans young people, it's just under six in ten. 
The percentage of queer young people who feel confident reporting this bullying in schools has plummeted in the last, year to, uh, the last decade to just one in four. One in five trans young people surveyed was forced to leave school, college or university as a result of the bullying and bigotry that they faced. It doesn't take a genius to work out why the situation for many trans pupils in our schools is getting worse rather than better. Some members of this parliament, including those condemning bullying in our schools, need to seriously re-examine your own conduct over the last few years and consider the consequences when you dehumanise trans people and question the very validity of their existence. What did you think was going to happen? This is the result. Yes. Okay, Jackson Carlo. I wonder if Mr Greer will agree with me that Alexander Stewart and I, on behalf of the Petitions Committee, have just come from Glasgow, where we met three 12-year-old girls, the victim of violence of other girls. Two were left unconscious in pools of blood and gore. In each case, and I haven't heard this reflected in the debate, the incidents were filmed by the friends of the perpetrator. The police and the schools accept the prima facie evidence, but say nothing can be done. Is that not really a problem that we have to get to grips with, that despite the evidence, the violence continues? I, I couldn't agree more with Mr Carl. I think that was a really welcome reflection, because the reality is, in terms of the legal framework that's set out at the moment, there is no reason not to take action. So we need to get to the bottom of why schools and other authorities like the police believe that they're unable to do so. I mean, I can speak from personal experience as a pupil of seeing this uh, action not be taken. Instances where I was the victim of bullying and where action wasn't taken. I think there are wider lessons to learn from the progress which has been made towards our schools becoming LGBTQ inclusive, though. The motion and the government amendment both mention the importance of recording instances of violence and disruption. Importantly, the Cabinet Secretary's amendment specifically mentions the need to accurately report these instances. The Time for Inclusive Education campaign brought the issue of reporting to the fore when they made the point that the number of recorded instances which mentioned a protected characteristic like sexuality was far lower than the number of instances which queer young people were reporting to them. It was clear the school were reporting instances of bullying and violence where bigotry was the motivating factor without including that key information. And I suspect that that is absolutely the case with misogynistic violence against young women and girls as well, where a report of any kind has even been made. And I'll come back to that point in a moment. I believe that Fife Council have developed a robust system for accurately reporting instances of bullying and harassment in their schools. That system, I believe, is separate from CMIS, um, and I would encourage the government and COSLA to uh, engage with them on what the rest of the country could learn from this approach. This may well make for an appropriate agenda item at the upcoming summit. Given the consensus today around the importance of collecting accurate data, I again have to ask MSPs who spent months undermining the pupil health and wellbeing census to take a moment to think about the impact that their opportunism has had. Last year's census was undoubtedly badly impacted and the response rate lowered as a result of the manufactured culture war nonsense pushed by those who should absolutely have known better, leaving us with less of exactly the kind of data we need to tackle this problem. I'll give way. Stephen Kerr. Ross Greer is badly judging the tenor of this debate. This wasn't, this wasn't a moment for this sort of uh, gratuitous speech. This is a moment for us as parliamentarians, ultimately, to unite and, and, welcome, and welcome what we're going to do in order to resolve this issue, which is a rising problem across Scotland. I think Ross Greer needs to think about the tone, the tenor of what he's saying. It's not good. Ross Greer? I think if Mr Kerr wants to reflect on tone and tenor, there are members behind him whose tone and tenor he could certainly reflect on. I'm reflecting on the fact that we do not have valuable, essential information on the experience of young people in our schools in relation to bullying because of a manufactured culture war issue around the health and wellbeing census. In Glasgow City Council, we had a 51% response rate. Within that, though, we found out that 12% of their pupils had been physically hurt by a bully in the last year. The other 49% of the pupils in Glasgow City Council, we don't know about because of the manufactured nonsense around the health and wellbeing survey. And I hope certain members will reflect on that. I didn't even mention which political party I thought was responsible, but Mr Kerr's intervention is very telling in that regard, presiding officer. I, I'm sorry, I do need to... Actually, I would, I would feel guilty if I didn't. So I'll take um, Ms. I, Ms. Mr. Greer, I, I think you should be actually seeking to start to think about your concluding statement. I appreciate it, uh, presiding officer. Uh, before finishing, though, I need to point out that the motion, though, as I said, well-intentioned as it is, 
doesn't mention young people as one of the groups to work with in tackling violence in our schools. I'm sure that that was just an oversight, but it is essential that young people are active participants in these discussions, not just the topic of conversation. If we want young people to feel uh, respected and safe in our schools, they need to be part of the conversations about how we make our schools safer. A point that I'm glad to say is reflected in the government's amendment. I welcome the fact that we appear to be developing a consensus in Parliament this afternoon. It's made clear to those who are watching that the Scottish Parliament and all of its members stand with them, whether it's members of school staff or pupils who are the victims of this violence. I hope that will provide some reassurance for them. Thank you, Mr Greer. And I now call Jackie Dunbar to be followed by Jamie Green. Ms Dunbar. Thank you, President Officer, and I'd like to refer to my register of interests as a former local councillor of Aberdeen City Council until the last elections last, uh, last year, uh, and I, of course, received re remuneration for it. Firstly, a point of consensus. I think we can all agree that any form of violence anywhere, but particularly in our school estate, is just unacceptable. As a parent myself, whose daughter was on the receiving end of taunts and emotional bullying while at school, I know how important it is to protect our young folk from bullying and intimidation. Within and out with our school estate, the safety of our pupils and our staff is paramount. However, I have to say I do feel that the Tory motion does little other than tar all young folk with the same brush, and I find that a very dangerous path to take. Never has a saying had more meaning than it takes a village to raise a child. We all have a collective responsibility when it comes to our children. I, 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 have I got time to take an intervention? Uh, a very brief intervention. Uh, who, uh, well, it was Mr Kerr I heard. It wasn't Ms Gallagher, but taking, uh, who, who, I don't mind which one it is. Stephen Kerr. Hey, gentlemen, Lee, I'm afraid. <laughs> but... but the point about the motion is ridiculous because her own government have pretty much copied it word for word <laughs> with one or two words. So I don't know what she's getting at. She's accusing her own front bench of being anti-young people, which we certainly are not on this side of the uh, house. Jackie Dunbar. Rubbish. I was not doing that. What I've been hearing is the tone of language that has been coming from the other, the other side. And I have not once heard today about, about the, the children who want to actually learn. Never has a saying had more meaning than it takes a village to raise a child. We all have a collective responsibility when it comes to our children. And the more you tell f young folk that their bullies are violent, then the more they will begin to think they are, the more they will act as though they are. And we should be talking up our children and not talking them down. Listening to the language of some in this chamber today, I'm disheartened that some appear to want headlines rather than solutions. Scotland's focus on progressive prevention action remains paramount, and the Scottish Government are taking specific action to engage with young folk to prevent further violence and harm. What the Tory motion fails to mention is that there can be a range of different factors which impact on children's behaviours in school. Often those factors are external to the school community and teachers are skilled professionals in diffusing challenges scenarios on a daily basis. And while it's clear that those, children, those teachers need support to respond to the challenging behaviour, it is also clear that examples of extreme events reported in the press must be treated very carefully, given we are talking about children. It is also well known that many of these stories in the press can become sensationalised through attention-grabbing headlines, and as leaders, we must be cognisant of this. Head teachers, teachers and all other school staff and local authorities are best placed to decide how to address bullying in our schools. No, I don't have time. Our local authorities have a statutory responsibility for the provision of education across our school estate, a fact many of us in this chamber should know all too well, with many of us coming from a local authority background. However, the Scottish Government does work closely with local authorities to tackle violence and bullying in schools, and that's supported by the wider investment of more than £2 million on violence prevention. And the Scottish Government also supports Scotland's national anti-bullying service, Respect Me, 
that provides advice and resources to schools, parents, carers and young folk. And that commitment is important. We must not forget, whether we like it or not, social media and online platforms are a big part in our young folks' lives now. And social media and online platforms have a responsibility to ensure that they do everything in their power in helping tackling bullying. And we mustn't treat online bullying differently from face-to-face -face bullying. We address online bullying effectively when we address it as part of our whole anti-bullying approach not as part of a separate area of work or policy. And the Scottish Government rightly takes online safety incredibly seriously and continues to liaise with law enforcement agencies to ensure that they have the powers and resources to tackle any incidences of criminality. However, re re uh, responsibility for social media lies within the UK Government, with the Scottish Government having limited means of intervention. The UK Government must call on social media companies to improve their own standards and sanctions when it comes to removing material that promotes violence, and we must back them on that call. Yet again, the Scottish Government is constrained, and this time it's on the online safety of children to take real action on bullying. However, despite this, in 2022-23, the Scottish Government is providing over £2 million to support delivery of prevention activity across Scotland. Projects the Scottish Government supports include the Mentors in Violence Prevention, delivered in schools and supported by Education Scotland. Medics Against Violence, who run several violence prevention programmes, targeting the impacts and consequences of violence. The no, Lives, Better Li the no Knives, Better Lives engagement programme through the Youth Link Scotland focuses on preventing the incidence of violence and knife carrying. Diversity and equality are at the heart of policies that underpin education in Scotland, and I ask the Cabinet Secretary that this will remain in our reports moving forward. Bullying must be addressed, but this must be done through prevention and understanding the root causes of behaviour, not through, not through demonisation of all young people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Barr. I now call Jamie Green to be followed by Bill Kidd. Mr Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I'm not sure which debate Jackie Dunbar has been in today, but it's not the one I've been in, that's for sure. Because let me say to her, you can shake your head, Mr. Dunbar, let me say to you, do not confuse members on these benches sharing real lived experiences of young people and teachers as somehow storytelling and manufactured grievance on our part. Because here's the reality. Jackie Dunbar needs to hear this. The real reality is the only manufactured grievance I've heard is coming from her benches this afternoon. Because here's another thing, Zaring Officer, it should not be opposition benches using opposition time to debate. This should be government time. And the government very well knows that, such as the sheepish look in the minister's face this afternoon. Because members across this chamber, members across this chamber have raised this issue in a second. I've got some important points to make. Repeatedly, Repeatedly, members right across the chamber have read very serious incidents. I raised one at topical questions last week. The Cabinet Secretary will recall that. And every time we raised these issues, we were met by the same similar responses, time after time after time. Here's what ministers said to us when we raised these issues in this chamber. These are isolated cases. No, they are not, Cabinet Secretary. These are issues for individual schools, we were told. No, they are not. Cabinet Secretary. This is something that local authorities should be tackling. No, it is not, Cabinet Secretary. And in fact, best illustrated from the very words of the Cabinet Secretary herself in response to my topical question on a very serious situation which happened in my region, a case I won't go into, she said, yes, they happen, but they are not the norm. But here's the reality we've heard this afternoon, hour after hour, member after member, case after case, this is the norm. Cabinet Secretary, this Ca is the norm. Cabinet Secretary, but far too many people to in Scotland, floor. far too many teachers are having their uh, workplace disrupted, far too many pupils are having their learning disrupted. The status quo clearly is causing harm for far too many. People are desperate, and that's why we make no apologies for bringing it to the Chamber this afternoon. 75,000 incidents, as we heard, of schools, uh, attacks in schools of the last year. That is not a few incidents. Seizing 200 dangerous items of young pupils. That is not a few. In fact, I put a shout out on social media yesterday challenging people to come and share their own real lived experiences. Teachers, pupils, anyone who wanted 
to participate in today's debate because we have a voice and they don't. And I have to say, the response was immense. I'm sure the same will be true of others ahead of today's debate. And every single one of them said the same thing. Please do not share my name or the name of the school because such is the fear that exists for raising these issues. And I would simply say that has to stop this culture of fear, the fear of teachers speaking out because of what the, the, uh, the repercussions within their own school, the fear of schools speaking out uh, because they don't want to admit that there's a problem, and the fear of local authorities speaking out and admitting there is a problem because of the reaction that the government uh, might give them. Here's what some of them had to say. Here's the reality, uh, Ms Dunbar. A teacher got in touch who worked for, as a supply teacher for three years said to me he had been attacked 10 times in just three years. That is not a few. I mean, that's life-changing. It's no wonder people are leaving the profession. That's not talking the profession down. That is standing up for the profession when we raise these issues in this parliament. Here's another one. Real life stories. A parent got in touch, and I won't read out the whole email, uh, but it was horrendous, utterly horrendous. Her 15-year-old son was subject to an unprovoked attack on a school bus by a group of seven boys. She asked me to share this story. She told me of many other incidents involving her son, two involved knives. And she said to me, all of these incidents were not addressed in any meaningful way at all. My son is petrified. He won't go to school. He's missing out on his learning whilst his attackers carry on with theirs. And that underlines the deep-rooted problem here, which is why we have to talk about this. Of course, the school responded and said, we can't do anything about this. It happened on a bus. The bus drivers won't do anything about it because they're petrified as well. Bus drivers are being attacked on the way to and from school. And the police, of course, rarely get involved. Uh, the member will need to be concluding soon because we've got no extra time in hand. Well, here's the problem here. The government won't like to hear, but there's so many factors are involved in this. This has been a perfect storm of events over the last couple of years that have led to this. A reduction in behavioural uh, support staff within schools, a failure to reduce classroom sizes, a loss of campus officers, a loss of locally funded police officers. All of these have resulted the ratio between teachers and pupils. These are all factors which have come into play. The government has put their head in the sands and refused to ignore it. Well, listen, now you cannot ignore the voices of teachers and pupils and parents who have all shared the horrendous experiences. Of all the party business and motions that we brought of late, I think this is the one that we should be most proud of because it was long overdue and it was much needed. It's always a shame that the government only talks about these things when it is under pressure or is embarrassed to do so. That must change. I support the motion in Stephen Kerr's name. Thank you, Mr Green. Before I call the next speaker, I would advise that we have now used up all the uh, extra time that we had, and therefore that means that members are perfectly free to take intervention, should they wish. But if they do, there will be no extra time added back, and they must absorb the time of the intervention within their own allocated time. I call Bill Kidd to be followed by Carol Mochin. Mr Kidd. Thank you very much, President Officer. I too agree no pupil, no teacher, no member of school staff should suffer any kind of abuse. In the recent incident at a Central Belt High School where three teachers had to receive medical treatment and a 14-year-old pupil was given medical assistance is an incident involving an ex-pupil horrified everyone. No one should have to go through this experience, and this is something that I know we all agree on. The Minister took many questions on this incident and the wider issues involved, and spoke to a number of the points raised in today's motion also. Her replies clearly showed the issue is one that uh, Government takes seriously. She's met and raised the matter with the Association of Directors of Education in Scotland, and as Chair of the Scottish Advisory Group on Relations, and behaviour in schools raised the matter with COSLA and trade union representatives. She also informed the member, um, all members that the Scottish Government is currently gathering evidence to help them better understand behaviour in schools at a national level through research on behaviour in Scottish schools. A key ask of the motion today, in fact, uh, the, member, uh, the Minister, beg your pardon, asked for an update on the research on behaviour in Scottish schools a number of weeks ago and informed the Chamber that she will be able to access that data in the autumn, at which point she will be in position to update Parliament. I genuinely understand the frustration and the strong feeling, and we all have to get the correct information so that we can go forward and change this bad situation. 
And of course, we would all want to have the data as soon as possible, um, but we have to make sure that the approach is right and that we deal with this very real issue effectively. This measured approach is definitely the right one. We need to work together with pupils, parents, teachers, local authorities, COSLA and other stakeholders and listen to them. Listen to what works, what doesn't work and what they, need, they want and they need. By working together, we will get it right. We'll get it right for every child, right for every teacher. And that's the right thing to do. I also think that we have to be measured and careful in how we characterise this issue. We need to be extremely careful not to stigmatise children by painting a picture that this behaviour is the norm. The majority of school kids are well behaved, are attentive, it's been said earlier on today, and they're keen learners, and we need to make sure we appreciate that, reward it, and acknowledge it. We need to listen to them and understand how this environment works for them and how we can further foster a positive learning environment for everyone. On the flip side, we need to listen to those who aren't as keen and for those who the environment doesn't work as well for to understand why and incorporate it into any future education strategies. Last week, I saw many members, including the presiding officer, um, get hands-on at the construction skills demonstration outside, sponsored by Gordon MacDonald, MSP, and Alec Rowley, MSP, in the gardens, and what was yet another sunny day. Now, the event saw construction skills demonstrations by young tradespeople where school pupils received a mini masterclass in key trades to help them make an informed decision about their career choices. Speaking to some of the pupils, I was struck by how, for many, the traditional learning model hadn't really appealed, but they got really keen when doing hands-on work. I spoke to the organisers about the support for the scheme from trade unions and what support there was from local authorities. Some, I was told, were very supportive and very positive about the scheme. Others, not so much. And I was sorry to hear that Glasgow was mentioned as one of the local authorities where they needed more support to get into every school and to reach out to every school child. Can the Minister perhaps look into this issue and get back to me regarding what Glasgow needs to do to offer these choices for the many for whom traditional learning is maybe not their thing? Speaking to the organiser from Glasgow City College, I was rem reminded of how many of us chose this alternative route to employment to doing something we got a lot out of. My grandfather was a stonemason in the building of the Kelvin Grove Art Galleries and the Kelvin Hall. And so was the organiser from Glasgow City College. Um, his family also were involved in this. And these people shared the same opportunities. And our kids in this century deserve to share them too. In conclusion, presiding officer, we all deserve the same chances in life. So let's work together to get it right for every Wayne. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr Kidd. And I now call Cara Mochin to be followed by Ben McPherson. Ms Mochin. Thank you, presiding officer. I welcome this debate on a topic that is rarely discussed so openly in the Parliament. And I do welcome some of the honest debate from members today. I'm sure for many the opportunity to, opportunity to see these issues addressed at national level will be refreshing. And I trust we will continue to shine a light on these very serious matters in the weeks and months to come. I know many teachers and support staff have raised concerns with all of us about this very subject, as we've heard, and they are right to do so. Not enough is being done. And I believe councils would love to do a lot more to help if only they had the resources to do so, which I think is at the heart of the matter we're discussing. In fact, I have spoken to a number of teachers who have reported incidents in which they genuinely feared a pupil or themselves would seriously be harmed. And what is really remarkable is that in those cases, the teacher's primary concern was the well-being of the pupil and what had led them to act in this way. And I think this tells us a lot about the caring and professional workforce that we do have. In many such cases, the problem is rooted in emotional and mental health needs and a lack of provision for young people when they actually need it most. Much of this stems from the serious poverty and neglect evident in parts of the country. It's often hidden, but it is always there. 
I'm sure many of you know that we have young people living lives that would be unimaginable, unimaginable to most of us um, and to others in our constituencies and regions, all of which contributes directly to worsening emotional, mental and physical health across the country. And of course, there is crossover of briefs here. I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will agree. I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary does not need me to remind her um, but currently, only 70% of children and young people are seen within 18 weeks of a mental health referral, well short of the government's already modest target of 90%. That is in a climate where more than 10,000 children and young people were referred to CAMS in quarter four of 2022 alone. That equates to thousands of children who are waiting endlessly for referral, and even those that do receive one are often waiting well beyond the point that they can actually bear. I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will recognise the toll these waiting times and lack of support are taking on young people is often intolerable. Teachers see the results of these difficulties day after day, yet, as we've said selflessly, um, they serve on and they continue. Presiding officer, I'm afraid to say that this government is letting young people and the workforce and schools down and a little bit of honesty is needed. This government has failed to deliver on class sizes, teacher non-contact time, support, support for pupils within additional support needs, mental health support for young people, failure to address harmful online content, continuing inequalities and cuts to youth services. Our teachers and young people deserve better and they need more action and more urgency to address these challenges. The Cabinet Secretary has in this chamber said that she is aware how teachers feel. Well, I'm sure that what she knows is that teachers are overworked, overtired and in many cases lacking the necessary support staff to assist them in increasingly difficult classrooms. And these issues are ones that trade unions have been pointing out over years, often with no significant response from the government. Education unions and others have repeatedly raised how vulnerable many teachers and staff are to assault or even worse. I have heard today, I'm sure we all are very genuinely fearful that this problem could go further if we do not take it more seriously. We know of some of the harrowing and sometimes tragic experience that have been expressed today and faced by teachers right across the United Kingdom. There is no room for complacency. We cannot assume that this will not happen in Scotland if it has happened across the UK. We are facing a serious challenge and we must act now. A summit is welcome, but alone it is not enough. We need to ensure the experiences set out here in the Chamber today and by those with lived experience are listened to, but more importantly, acted upon. Teachers are workers just like anyone else and they deserve the same level of respect and consideration that you would offer, offer anyone in a workplace place, and indeed anyone uh, in your family. We need to raise awareness among parents and pupils that this is a real and prevailing situation that requires every effort from everyone across the board. Um, if, it's been considered, if it's to be considered in a meaningful way, we must engage pupils, parents, professionals. Um, in concluding, presiding officer, I do reiterate that it is welcome that we are having the debate, but it should be in government time. Um, we are today you know, contributing, I think, to a good debate, but I think it would be important for the government to raise this again. As we're running out of time, thank you to all the contributors and thank you, presiding officer. Thank you, Ms Morgan. And I now call Ben McPherson, who will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr McPherson. Thank you, President Officer. And I, too, welcome this important debate and I'm glad to be able to participate in it and having been able to listen to colleagues around how together we work to collectively support our teachers, our professionals and other members of staff working in schools across our constituencies and regions. And I don't think it really matters uh, which uh, time we're using here in Parliament. The, the, the focus should be what our collective responsibility is, and it's good that we've had a, a largely constructive debate today. I also, uh, as well as welcoming uh, the, the opposition using their time, uh, the gov I also welcome the government's response uh, and commitment that's clearly been uh, illustrated and demonstrated in the amendment and also in the words of the, the Cabinet Secretary. And I think I would want to take this opportunity to point out the fact that we have a former teacher and also a minister with her life experience in the roles that they're 
occupying is a good thing for all of Scotland and we as a parliament collectively should be doing all we can to constructively work with ministers because when our education system succeeds, our young people succeed and when our young people succeed that's an investment for the benefit of the common good of all of Scotland. And in that spirit I do think it's been vital that colleagues across the chamber have raised incidents anecdotally and, and, and general statistics about the, the, the challenge that we face together about violence in our schools. But it's also a symptom of more uh, wider challenging behaviour. And that context of the difficulties of the last years, the pandemic and other challenges, challenges that we confront right now in a cost of living crisis. Uh, social media is not a catalyst for this uh, symptom of, of behaviour and trend, but it's absolutely a factor in it. Uh, as uh, Jackson Carla's example um, so uh, terrifyingly illustrated. Uh, but it's also beyond the school setting. And the points that colleagues have raised around the need for a community response, the need for the third sector's involvement are absolutely true. And I would want to emphasize my experience of that as a constituency MSP for Edinburgh, Northern and Leith. Because when I was, uh, first had the privilege of being elected in, in 2016, we were experiencing issues in the north of my constituency in school uh, and also in the community with really significant, serious uh, antisocial behaviour and violence. Indeed, my only FMQ that I've asked was on this very issue. Uh, I probably need to ask some more. Um, <laughs> but you know, what happened in that situation where we had particularly as well as violence, we had motorbike theft and then joyriding of those motorbikes. And it was a you know, really concerning situation. It's, it's, not, it's not completely resolved, but it's much, much better now. And it's much better because we had schools working together, we had the police working together, we had the community working together, and we had youth work engagement. And one of those organisations, there were many organisations who made a difference, but one of those organisations I want to highlight is the Spartans Alternative School because what they did during that time and continue to do in North Edinburgh is remarkable. Utilising PEF funding, uh, but also raising resource from other fundraisers and, and their own fundraising initiatives. And using the power of football and strong teaching staff, persuasive personalities, and just real credibility in the community they have been able to turn around the lives of some people who were really struggling in school, being violent, not achieving, and not giving their best, and in that, disrupting others. And what's remarkable about the Spartans Alternative School is that they've done it on their own initiative in North Edinburgh. So perhaps there are some lessons there, touching on what Bill Kidd raised around how do you help people who don't necessarily engage as well as others in the traditional ways of education. And I know we've committed collectively to a presumption to mainstream, but perhaps now is a time to look at other models, to look at the way things are done, to not be ideological in how we approach that, but at the same time hold true to equality of provision. Um, and if the government would i like to visit the, the alternative school at Spartans. I'd be more than happy to facilitate that. It's not a panacea, but in this collective challenge that we face, I think if we're all open-minded, maybe we can make a bigger difference. And in that, another important lesson from North Edinburgh is that while we have too many incidents, terrifying incidents of violence in our schools, we also need to collectively emphasise, as the Cabinet Secretary rightly highlighted, that this is a minority of young people that are involved in this. A minority that is disruptive, a minority that is causing harm and damage. But there's, a majority, there's also a majority of young people there that we need to use debating time to talk about their achievements, to big up their academic excellence, to big up the achievement of their goals uh, and make sure that we're giving equal, if not more, emphasis to the positive, as well as dealing with this collective challenge that we face.
Thank you, Ms McPherson. And we now move to closing speeches. And I call on Martin Whitfield to close on behalf of Scottish Labour up to six minutes, please. I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I would remind those viewing of my register of interests that I referred to earlier. Um, I have to say this, and I say this with an open heart. It's becoming a great pleasure to follow Ben McPherson and his contributions to these debates, because I think in the speech that Ben McPherson has just given, he has managed to capture so much of what's been very positive about this debate. Um, and I too would look forward to a fruitful discussion about mainstreaming and what we mean by mainstreaming when we consider the alternative educational provision that exists across Scotland and is extremely good examples of fine, fine practice. This has been a pleasurable debate at many times. Can I first welcome um, what I see very much as a change of approach with the change of the Cabinet Secretary, and I do emphasise my welcome for that, and I hold out um, great optimism that we can see better and stronger cross-party support where we can reach conclusions that support our young people, that support our educational staff, including our teachers, that can support our local authorities and fundamentally support our communities. Um, and certainly I can assure the Cabinet Secretary that support from this side of the House will come for those discussions, will come for those um, conclusions. And in that mind, I want to mention a couple of things by way of parliamentary formality. We would have supported, but for the rule of preemption, um, the amendment today, and we will be supporting, irrespective of the outcome of various votes, um, what I will hope can be considered an agreed motion at the end of today and one that I think we can rightly judge this Parliament and this Scottish Government on over the forthcoming weeks and months, because as my early intervention um, on Stephen Kerr's excellent opening, uh, and I welcome um, his contribution that we, we need to take a holistic view of the experience our young people have in education, rather than one-off uh, events, but we will be held to account by the outcome of all of the proposals that we've heard today and the sooner the better. And I want to just emphasize the question of data because we've heard about violence. Many members have contributed about bullying. We've heard a lot about, sadly, pupil on teacher violence. Not as much, but similarly important, is pupil on pupil violence. These are all different. They are all separate. They all have different solutions. And the thing that brings them together is that that tends to occur on the educational estate. But I think, as Jamie Greer rightly pointed out, that actually events that are happening outside of it, particularly on school buses, um, and I think most of us will have had correspondence from constituents on that, there is a challenge when it's outside of the school as to who is going to take responsibility. But the consequences of that violence on the individual victims is, is still the same. I also welcome and wholly endorse the question of the language that's used about this, because we are speaking about a minority of pupils. Um, sadly, the number of incidences are increasing, and I think it speaks to all of the very powerful subjective evidence that we've heard today, particularly the letter that Murdo Fraser read out. There is huge amounts of subjective evidence. There is less objective metadata, and I know the Cabinet Secretary is talking about that when she's seeking to mine into a granular level the data that does exist and I hope the data that will exist in the very near future. I also want to mention the, the, the question about COVID because I would like to think that we have acceptance that COVID has not been the cause of the situation that our schools find itself in, but it has certainly been an accelerating factor in a trail of behaviour that has been increasing. And I'm not going to make it party political because I think it is right a member's contribution, my apologies, I forget who, about that this is a challenge that education is facing, certainly across the Western world, about its approaches. But COVID has accelerated that, and I think we've reached a position where we can acknowledge that our education system is in crisis in relation to this. That doesn't mean good work isn't happening, but it is in crisis. And I think it is up to us in this place to make sure that we support um, everything we can do to change that situation as soon as possible. I am, of course, conscious of the UNCRC Article 19, where our young people have a right to be tr protected from being hurt or badly treated. And that includes 
um, exploitation, neglect, other things, but also violent images, which brings me to the many comments that we've had about social media. I'm not in total agreement with uh, Willie that I'm not going to shoot the messenger because I think the social media companies do have a responsibility, but also there is a responsibility for those that provide the Wi-Fi access, which in the purposes of this debate is, of course, our local authorities and the responsibilities that they may find themselves in being the carrier, particularly of images, particularly of attitudes towards young people by other young people. Um, time is very short, but I do want to um, raise the, the example that Ruth Maguire gave about North Ayrshire, because I do think there is something that has to be explored between notifications that have been given as an employee to their employer of near miss incidents through the health and safety executive and the other contributions talking about that that arrives through CMIS. These are two separate systems. One has a legislative requirement, the other is quite frankly good practice and needed for reporting. Um, but I think there is something to be looked at as to why those two are so separate. Again, I am very conscious of time. There's much that I would have liked to have talked about, particularly, I think, the very powerful speech of Alex Rowley. But I would like to thank the majority, the vast majority of members um, who have come to this debate with positive ideas, sadly subjective ex examples. But again, and not to make Ben McPherson feel too embarrassed about this, I think there is space to celebrate what is good and great that's happening in our schools to those children who have alternative education methods, and they're there because the mainstream, the mainstream school architecture doesn't work for them, and their contributions, as shown last week in the skills courses, are as valuable as everybody else's. I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Whitfield. I now call on Cabinet Secretary General Ruth to respond on behalf of the Scottish Government. Up to seven minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding Officer, I have listened intently to the contributions this afternoon. Uh, I shall not be providing marks out of ten, but suffice to say, I think... Some contributions clearly listen to my contribution more so than others. So, two stars and a wish. Because I have very much recognised the challenge here, and it's really important we, we get it right. And we've heard from a number of contributions this afternoon about the pressures that schools are, are working under. Yes, COVID impacts, ongoing cost of living impacts. I was in uh, the school I taught in not far from here, presiding officer, a few weeks ago now, uh, where the school prom is usually held in an expensive hotel in central Edinburgh, and it costs quite a lot of money. And that school are now providing the prom in the school this year, reducing the cost for all pupils to attend. They've now put on a kind of swap shop where children can come and use dresses and some of the contributions have been donated to the school. So it's a much more affordable experience for all people. And that's a school in a very middle class suburb in central Edinburgh. And if that school is struggling, I wonder what that means for other schools in the relation to the cost of living crisis and how that presents in the school day. I do think we need a, a partnership approach and I want to come on to respond to individual contributions to it because we heard, I think, some really good contributions this afternoon, presiding officer. And as CoCab Stewart said, the vast majority of classrooms are happy learning environments. And I don't think any member today would disagree with that sentiment, but we all accept that there are examples, and we have heard some of those today, and I accept that, where that is not necessarily the case. Now, Willie Rennie um, started in his contribution in relation to the, the bitter figures, of course, which I think he said hadn't been collected for years. I just wanted to put on record that's because, of course, of the pandemic. They are collected on a four-yearly cycle. However, um, I have been pushing my officials for early sight of those, uh, that data, and, of course, um, keen to publish it as soon as we are able to. It will give us that granularity of focus that Martin Whitford actually spoke to and that we don't currently have in relation to some of the FOI requests that opposition parties have requested from local authorities because they take a variety of different methods in relation to how they gather data. Some of them didn't respond to the requests as well. So that data set doesn't give us a full national picture. So I just want to put that on the record. He, he also made a point around restorative approaches, which I think I responded to in my uh, initial uh, speech, and I wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, restorative approaches work, but they work with that partnership approach around the individual classroom teacher. And if that isn't there, they can be quite a weak measure, I think, in relation to how we respond to our children and young people. Now, Murdo Fraser, I thought, made an offer to me to visit a school uh, in his uh, region. I would accept that invitation, and I, I heard the contribution he made in relation to a teacher uh, in his area and their experience. Um, I'm very keen to hear about teachers' experience in schools. Um, I want to get out and into schools. I've been spending, as I think I said in my initial contribution, uh, a lot of my time doing just that. And I think it's been quite heartening, uh, listening to staff quite taken aback that the Cabinet Secretary is asking them about behaviour in schools. It's become almost unfashionable to talk about these things, but I think it's important that we, we do. I've made it very clear to my officials, as I say, that this is a, a focus and an absolute um, 
you know, clarity for me as Cabinet Secretary that we get this right because just now our schools are struggling and I, I recognise that post-COVID. Um, and I don't accept that this is something that's happened overnight in relation to the pandemic, but it has nonetheless, um, I think, compounded some of the challenge faced in our schools. Now, Ruth McGuire spoke about her local authorities' approach to a more consistent approach to recording and monitoring incidents. And we heard that from a number of members here today. Um, I alluded to the HMI inspection on bullying, which I think we also heard from uh, another member on the Conservative benches, which actually looked at some of the inconsistencies in relation to how those events were recorded. So we need greater consistency. That is an issue that the summit will have to address. Um, I think some of the challenge in schools during the pandemic looked to the different ways of learning and teaching and how that was expressed. So, for example, during the pandemic, uh, we encouraged schools to have good ventilation, so windows were open. Young people, for example, were able to wear their jackets in class, and that was a huge shift. And now some of the challenges that teachers are facing is getting young people to take their jackets off bluntly. So these are the day-to-day -day things that classroom teachers are grappling with. And I know we've had a focus this afternoon on violence, but I also want to remind members it's not just about violence. Sometimes this is verbal abuse in the classroom. There are different ways in which um, challenging behaviour can manifest. It's not always, certainly not in my experience, it never was uh, violence. I want to... Happy to do so. Liam Kerr. Uh, I'm very grateful. Uh, just on that exact point, does the Minister take a view on, or the Cabinet Secretary take a view on the proposed solutions being implemented or proposed by Northfield Academy in Aberdeen, and how is that work informing her proposed solutions for a summit? Cabinet Secretary. I actually cited on the proposed solutions at Northfield uh, Academy. However, I have asked my officials for a visit to that very school, recognising some of the challenge that has been highlighted in recent times in that inspection report. I think the, the previous contribution from Martin Whitford looked to talk about some of the celebration in our schools, and I think it's important uh, that we remember there is some great work going on in our schools. You know, I was in a school in East Kilbride a couple of weeks ago, learning about the ways in which they're supporting their young people through what have been a challenging two years. Our teachers are really skilled at doing this, so I, I uh, defer to their professionalism as a former teacher and trusting them to respond appropriately, but they do need support, and that is what I hope the summit will seek to provide. Happy to do Morning, so. Glennon. Grateful to the Cabinet Secretary. It has been a, a good debate and I think we should remember that violence is preventable and that's what a public health approach to, to violence is all about. It's about prevention. Can the Cabinet Secretary say what role the Scottish Violence Reduction Unit will play in informing the summit and government's um, response to the challenges that we've heard that are not just in school but also in our communities? Cabinet Secretary. I'm happy to engage with the Scottish Violence Reduction Unit. I know they do some really good work and I think the member makes a very important point in relation to how that's encompassed with our response. Um, at the summit. Um, I wanted to come back to a number of points that were made by, by Alex Rowley and he talked about some of the points that have been raised by our teaching trade unions. Of course, I declare an interest as a former member of the EIS. I recognise that this is not something that has happened post-COVID. This is an issue that the unions have been campaigning on over a number of years now. It's important we get it right and we recognise it in government and I hope members have heard from me today that is the approach that I will take and certainly in my engagements with trade unions thus far they've been supportive of that additionally. Um, now, Cocab Stewart spoke of the importance of adverse childhood experiences, and I think I alluded to some of this uh, in my initial contribution, presiding officer, recognising that some young people in our school are traumatised, and we need to make sure that there is support in place to recognise that. And um, I think that's really important because we know that in relation to exclusions, for example, children coming from disadvantaged backgrounds are far more likely to find themselves excluded and that is really detrimental to their progression. So we need to be mindful of that too. I thought Carol Mohan made an excellent contribution in relation to uh, the role that teachers have in their classrooms and the care that they have as well for their young people, the worry and care that sits alongside that. I very much would recognise that. She is right to also point to the cross-portfolio nature of challenge in relation to mental health. Now, we have provided funding in relation to school counsellors, but I am very keen to work with my health colleagues on that issue more broadly because I do recognise the, the need for us to look across portfolios out of our silos in government to better support our young people. Cabinet Presiding Secretary, officer, could I ask you please to conclude? Thank you. Yes, I am mindful of time. Um, I just want to thank members for their contributions this afternoon. In general, it's been a very positive debate. It's important we get a response in government right. The summit will seek to bring together partners to do just that and also to work with our teachers who, of course, are at the chalk face and I think will be central to delivering the solutions we need to see in responding to behaviour our schools. Presiding officer. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And I now call on Megan Gallagher to close, uh, to wind up on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Up to eight minutes, please, Ms Gallagher. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We have heard the harrowing stories from across the Chamber about the increasing levels of violence in our schools. The first time I heard about the true extent of the problem was when I took part in a panel event with the NAWUST. 
The union spoke openly about how the education workforce are adversely affected by a minority of pupils who challenge authority, use threatening behaviour, abusive language and, in some instances, physical violence. No one should go to work feeling unsafe. Yeah, yeah. When I was putting together some words to say during today's debate, I found myself returning to the same question. How did things get so bad? The testimonies we've heard uh, today from across the Chamber are a damning assessment of Scotland's education system. Colleagues have approached teachers directly so they can share their stories and it shows that we have a serious problem. It's not our voices that need to be heard, it's the voices of education professionals who need this government's support. But what I will say to Ross Greer, that if he thinks that raising concerns on behalf of parents and young people is stoking up a culture war, then I think he needs to maybe reevaluate what it means to be an MSP. Yes, I will. Ross Greer. I'm grateful to the intervention. Without wishing to assume the experience of others, I'm pretty sure I have more experience than most members in this room of being the pupil left bloodied by an attack at school. But I'm just interested in what made the Conservatives so uncomfortable when I was raising the experiences of LGBTQ young people who face violence at school. Megan Gallagher. That, that wasn't the case at all. We were referring to concerns raised on behalf of parents yeah. and young people, and I don't think that Mr Greer should misconstrue what we were trying to point out yeah, yeah, yeah. at all. <laughs> Presiding officer, voices are powerful, and Murdo Fraser quoted the experiences of one teacher. He said that the teacher had seen people being sworn at, spat at, punched, scratched and bitten tables thrown and colleagues who have had multiple trips to the hospital. But the part of Murdo Fraser's contribution that should shame this government is when the teacher said, getting it right for every child is an absolute joke. That's not coming from an MSP in this chamber, but from one of Scotland's educators. There is something fundamentally wrong with our education system, and it's clear that our teachers have had enough. Rachel Hamilton pointed out... Yes, absolutely. For Megan Gallagher for giving way. I wonder if she agrees with me that the Scottish Government's response so far has been reactive and they're actually scrambling to deal with symptoms. And that's only one side of the coin. Consideration should be given to how we tackle these issues before they become a crisis, like investing in preschool activity, and in, which includes a healthy breakfast. So tackling hunger, mental and poor phys and physical health, uh, and tackling Ms. Ms. Mizzou, I think we need to go back to Ms. Gallagher. Megan Gallagher. I thank um, Brian Mittal for his intervention and I couldn't agree more. Prevention is key and we need to look at other ways in which we can tackle the issues that we yeah. see in our schools. Rachel Hamilton pointed out that our teachers have succeeded not because of this SNP government but in spite of the reforms. We need to find solutions to the unacceptable level of violence that we see in our school. Last week when I raised violence in our schools as part of a long list of SNP government failings, the, and if the Cabinet Secretary is looking for somewhere to start, then this is the place to start, yeah. by making our schools a safe space for teachers to teach and pupils to learn. Absolutely. Because, as we've heard so frequently today, this isn't a new, po a new problem. Teachers have been raising this problem for years, and the unacceptable violent culture, as Pam Duncan Glancy rightly raised, has been allowed to grow. Yeah. And as we've seen, to see a Cabinet Secretary, we've yet to see actually a Cabinet Secretary of this government do something about the increasing violence in our schools. But it was, I've taken quite a few today, so if you could forgive me, I would like to continue on. Um, it was reassuring that the majority of the speeches today approached this issue with good intention. Yeah. In June 2022, I raised the issue of violence in our classrooms and again concerns by the NAW UST union. One union representative said it's as if they, they meaning the Scottish Government, really don't want to know the scale of the problem. I also asked the Scottish Government at that time to accept that cuts to council and education budgets were putting our teachers at risk, or the inaction, of course, of reducing classroom sizes, as mentioned earlier. Shona Robertson, who was the, uh, the Cabinet Secretary responding at that time, then announced that research into school behaviours had been cancelled due to COVID, with no confirmation that the research would be reinstated later. And although the Advisory Group of Relationships and Behaviours in Schools met last December, the then Cabinet Secretary did not attend something that Willie Rennie raised in his contribution. But I don't actually think that the advisory board has met since, and that was something that I did want to 
to ask the Cabinet Secretary earlier on because I think it's important that we as MSPs know exactly what the groups are discussing in order, that, in order for us to, to be able to take the matters on and raise them fully within our respective roles. Stephen Kerr also pointed out that parents are worried about their children's safety and prospects. Pam Gossel spoke about bullying and the untold damage this will have on a child's mental health and ability to learn. And this reiterates, I think, the importance of bringing everyone together to tackle this problem. But I do want to know and understand further how the government can understand the scale of the problem when they haven't collected, let alone published, data on violent incidents in our schools since 2016. That's seven years ago. And we can hazard a guess that some of the causes... Yes, certainly. Cabinet Secretary. I thank the member for giving me... I think I've responded on this point a number of times in the, in the chamber today. Of course, the uh, research should have been carried out in 2020. It couldn't be carried out in 2020 because of the lockdown, but it is going ahead. So I hope that gives the member a reassurance in relation to the reason why it was not able to be carried out, because we were in lockdown, children weren't in school. Megan Gallagher. Yes, yes, and I, I, I do accept that point, but it doesn't mean that, you know, that it's acceptable that it's taken seven years where nothing has happened in that time. Presiding officer, the Conservative motion today is one of concern and solution, and I am pleased that the SNP has supported our principles and action points, and it's good to see that they have finally accepted Conservative education policy. Yeah, yeah. Although I would say changing a couple of words in trying to call an amendment might be a bit of a stretch. However, the Scottish Conservatives will be supporting the SNP's amendment this evening. That's cross-party working at its best. And I do hope that the Scottish Government will agree um, to our action points outlined by Stephen Kerr earlier on, particularly the first three, the summit that must meet urgently, a statement in Parliament on the outcomes of the summit and an action plan to tackle violence and disruption in our school. Presiding officer, this government can't be allowed to get away with any more years of doing nothing. I do welcome the Cabinet Secretary's warm words of working to tackle this issue, but until we see the results, it was just another... It's just another way that the Scottish Government, sorry, Scottish Conservatives will need to hold the Scottish Government to account to end the violence in our schools. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Gallagher. And that concludes the debate on ending violence in Scottish schools. And it is now time to move on to the next item of business. The next item of business is consideration of motion 9109 in the name of Marie Todd on Powers of Attorney Bill UK legislation. I call on Marie Todd to move the motion. Thank you, uh, Minister. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 9147 in the name of George Adam. Uh, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme, I call on George Adam, Minister, to move the motion. Thank you very much, President Officer, and moved. Thank you, Minister. No member has asked to speak on the motion. The question is that motion 9147 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 9148 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on stage two timetable. I call on George Adam, Minister, to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer. I'm moved. Thank you, Minister. Uh, no member has asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 9148 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of two Parliamentary Bureau motions. I asked George Adam, Minister, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau to move motions 9149 on approval of SSI and 9150 on parliamentary recess dates. I'm Minister. both moved. President Thank you. Also. Minister, the question on these motions will be put at decision time, to which we have now come. Uh, so the first question uh, to be put, and in this regard, I would remind members that if the amendment in the name of Jenny Gilruth is agreed to, the amendment in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy will fall by way of preemption. So the first question is that amendment 9126.3 in the name of Jenny Gilruth, which seeks to amend motion 9126 in the name of Stephen Kerr on ending violence in Scottish schools be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are not all agreed and therefore we will move to a vote and there will be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system.